Okay, very cool. We are live. So hopefully friends and fans of Long McQuaid and Roland, you're joining us today for this V drums workshop. It's all about leveling up your V drums. That's, you know, your module, your kit, how you're using it, connectability. We're going to get into all of those things. I'm just going to talk a little bit first, make sure that we give people enough time to sort of log in and join on if they uh, feel so inclined. I've got my friends from Long McQuaid on the other end of the phone here just to help me out. Uh, let me know when you guys have questions. So if at any point during this presentation you have a question about something that I'm talking about or something V-Drums related or whatever, just pop a comment. And if I don't see the comments, the Long McQuaid team will forward your questions to me and I'll get to them as soon as I can. I have a, a bunch of really cool stuff that I'm going to be telling you guys about and showing you and, and, and teaching you how to do on your V-Drums kit. Um, but uh, I want to make this open-ended and, and hopefully if you have specific questions about your own V-Drums experience, I can answer those for you as well. So my name is Miles Gibbons. I'm a professional musician, a freelance musician in Toronto, and I'm also the percussion product specialist for Rolling Canada in uh, sort of like the Eastern Canada area. So normally what I do are presentations and workshops like this. I was actually scheduled to do one today at the Long McQuaid in Burlington, but unfortunately because of the lockdown, that is impossible, but I'm very glad that I'm able to do it in this new format for you guys today over the internet to make it as accessible as possible for as many people. So, okay, cool. So it looks like we're logged on. I see some people are already commenting. Excellent. All right. So we're connected. That's fantastic. So today we're going to be talking about V drums. Okay. And that's an electronic drum set. It's uh, a product from Roland. We've got tons of kits. They've been around for 30 years and they've been a part of my musical experience and my professional experience the entire time that I've been a musician. When I started playing drums, uh, my dad was also a drummer and just at the time we didn't really, our living situation couldn't accommodate for an acoustic kit. So right around the time that I decided I wanted to try playing the drums, he decided he wanted to sort of get back into them. So uh, we went to a uh, local Long McQuaid and bought, uh, at the time it was a used TD7. So that was what uh, he sort of rekindled uh, his love for the instrument with. And it's what I learned on initially, as well as taking, you know, some drum set lessons until we could build a soundproof room and I could put an acoustic kit in there. But since then, uh, V drums and, and Roland hybrid products and, and, and pads and, and samplers and stuff have been a part of my, like I said, my musical and my professional professional um, toolkit since the dawn of my, my playing experience. So I'm very proud to be presenting them to you today. So the kit that I have in front of me right now is brand new from Roland, just released a few a few months ago from NAMM. This is the uh, TD27KV. So brand new module, a bunch of new features. It's really great. I'm going to be demonstrating a bunch of things that are specific to this kit, but a lot of what I'll be demonstrating, and I'm going to be as clear about this as I possibly can, is uh, many of these concepts are applicable on different kits as well. So if you're at home on a TD17 uh, or a TD1, or if you've invested in something like a TD50, uh, a good chunk of what I'll be talking about today will be accessible to you as well. There just might be different ways of doing it. Um, so before I get started, I want to just uh, just do a little bit of a disclaimer here. So as you can see, I'm not in a long McQuaid, unfortunately, because of the lockdown. Um, I'm unable to do this in a store or something like that. So I'm doing this from my apartment. Uh, I don't have the greatest internet here, so please bear with me if there are some, some video or, or audio issues. Please let me know and I'll do what I can to mitigate them, but uh, please uh, thank you in advance for your patience and your understanding in, in dealing with uh, sort of whatever's happening with this stream because of my uh, low speed internet. Anyway, so I'm going to talk a whole bunch. Like I said, I'll answer as many of your questions as I can. But before I get into uh, any of the nitty gritty of what we're going to be talking about today in terms of using V-Drums, I do just want to play a little bit. Just to sort of give you uh, an umbrella sort of representation of some of the things and some of the concepts I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm just going to open up a little session here. And uh, I'm going to mute this mic so you don't hear the pads. And uh, I'm just going to play a little bit for you so you can uh, hear the V-Drums in action.
Cool. Okay. Thank you for tuning in. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I've got my, my TD27 module connected to my computer and I've got the output of that running through here. So I'm using some custom samples on the kit. I'm triggering some stuff from Ableton, uh, a DAW or, or a sequencing program that I have. So I'm going to get into all that kind of stuff, designing custom sounds, connecting to your computer, recording. I just wanted to give you a taste of all that to kind of, uh, to kind of kick things off before I just start talking. So again, for anybody that's joining us, I want to make this as open-ended as I possibly can. Um, so if you have questions about anything that's going on on the screen that you're hearing or seeing, please let me know in the comments. I'll either check the comments or I've got the Long McQuaid team uh, forwarding your, your questions to me. And, uh, and thank you in advance for, for, uh, for tuning in and, and sticking around. And if you are unable to stick around for the entire performance, uh, this will be saved and, uh, and you'll be able to access it from Long McQuaid's Facebook page. So, as I mentioned before, I'm sitting down beside the TD27KV which is the newest V-Drums kit from, uh, from Roland, uh, released uh, just recently uh, after NAMM. Uh, so this is a brand new module and a really, really high quality pad set, both featuring some exciting new technology from, from Roland. So V-Drums, as I mentioned, are digital drums. They are electronic drums, and they are a fantastic tool, especially in these lockdown times, whether you are a hobbyist or you're a semi-pro musician or you're playing for full time, it's really great that you know, while we're all stuck at home and, and you know, we're, our neighbors are home more often than they normally would be, we have these fantastic instruments that we can, uh, we can practice and play on. Uh, and that's been a very helpful thing for me. It's been great to, to have some extra free time to just sort of rekindle my love for the instrument and rediscover some of the things that I found really joyful when I started playing when I was 12. Uh, rather than having to learn people's repertoire, I've been at home learning, you know, pop punk songs from when I was 12 and, and prog rock songs from when I was 14 that I couldn't quite get back then. So it's been really exciting to be able to practice those at home and, and not bother the neighbors. And on a professional side, uh, it's been really nice to, to be able to do remote sessions sessions for people. I've been doing a couple of recording sessions right here in this very room on this very kit with the setup that you're seeing. So it's been helpful for me in a creative sense but also in a professional sense. So again we're going to talk about all those things today. So the TD27KV features a couple different kind of pads. There are the traditional or you know you could call them analog pads that feature piezo sensors. So that would be the PDX100 toms, the VH10 hi-hat, CY13 and CY12 cymbal pads, uh, the KT10 kick pads. So those are uh, traditional electronic drum pads. They connect with a quarter inch cable into your module. They send an acoustic impulse to the brain or the module which converts that impulse into data which is then run through the prismatic sound engine which I'll touch on later uh, to create sound. So one of the really exciting things about this kit in particular are the CY18DR and PD140DS ride and snare pads. So these were introduced for the TD50, which is our flagship uh, V-Drums line. And the thing that uh, separates these two pads and makes them stand out is the fact that they are digital pads. So that means a couple things. So one is that they have electrostatic sensors in them, which is the same type of technology in your touchscreen phone or, or uh, tablet or something like that. So it's extremely sensitive. I'll demonstrate that in a second. And and the other thing that's cool about them being digital pads is they actually have circuit boards in them and processing is done at the source. So that takes a load off the module and allows a more nuanced, detailed uh, signal, a more nuanced and detailed information about your performance to be sent to the module, which of course leads to a more nuanced and detailed performance. So I'm just going to switch my mic off for a second. I'm going to show you a couple cool things. The positional sensing on the snare for an authentic and realistic playing experience with, you know, head, rim shot, cross stick, all that stuff, and then the ride symbol, how sensitive it is to touch, which is really cool. Let me turn off my Ableton tambourines. We're showing you some funny stuff. All right, let me correct that. There we go. Okay, here we go.
and so on and so forth. So you're hearing a ride cymbal pad that uh, can be muted with a touch and you know instead of thinking of it as your traditional three zone cymbal with a bell, bow and an edge, you get a nice spread of sound over the surface of the cymbal and the sounds react more the way uh, an acoustic cymbal would if you were say for example to crash it and then play on the bow. And the snare you get extreme detail for things like buzz strokes and flams and drags and all your rudimental stuff. You've got a nice punchy rim shot, you've got positional sensing so that as you play across the surface of the head, you're not hearing the same sound or the same tonality over and over again. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Prismatic Sound Engine, which is basically the sampling and playback software inside the module that allows these pads to create such an amazing sound. So the Prismatic Sound Engine is the newest sound engine, and you can find that in the TD-17, the TD-27, and the TD-50, our entire current V-Drums lineup. And basically what that is, is a collection of pristinely recorded acoustic drum samples. So all of your acoustic samples or acoustic sounds in the module are in fact acoustic drums that have been recorded in top flight recording studios with varying mic positions, with different types of strokes, different places around the head to give you a more realistic experience. So, you know, any one sound in your V-Drums module is actually comprised of a myriad different versions or different recordings of the same drum to give you more detail and more options in terms of tonality. Uh, and the Prismatic Sound Engine now takes all those samples, plays them depending on your playing style or your performance, so the velocity, how hard you're playing, uh, the position where you're playing over top of the head, and then assigns them um, that way and then processes them to give you a blend of this amazingly recorded acoustic sound with the V-Drums prismatic uh, modeling to give you a nice responsive playing experience. So the other, uh, the other pads on this are fantastic. The VH10 is a real action hi-hat, sits on a hi-hat stand. The control module is underneath. The symbol is at the top, so you get the same motion that you'd expect from acoustic hi-hat. Some swings, some flex. So not only does it sound amazing and is the sound responsive, but the feel is authentic as well. So you've got you know dual zone pads everywhere. You can fire separate sounds from the head and the rim. Um, these pads are really great. The, the, the PDX100s give you 10 inch playing surface, totally unencumbered. So all of these are cross woven dual ply mesh heads. The snare is actually a triple ply. And then they all have raised rims. So the sensation of playing on the rim or playing a rim shot is reflected again, not only in the sound produced by the Prismatic Sound Engine, but also in the feel from the kit itself. Um, the symbols you get, natural flex, dual zones. The CY13 can be used as a ride symbol if you, if you aren't using a CY18. Um, so there's a bunch of really, really great pads. And of course, this is all expandable. What I want to talk about now really quickly is the module because the module is the heart and soul of this drum kit and it gives you the ability to do a ton of amazing things uh, by itself or connected with other devices. So I'm just going to switch views here so you can see the module. So this is the TD27 module. It's very user friendly, uh, very simple to navigate. You've got a bunch of instant access controls right on the panel and the menus are laid out in a very efficient way. So if you need to get in and tweak a setting, uh, the most critical settings in fact are accessible right from the front of the module and then the menus are very easy to get in and around but the user friendliness of this and the, and the efficiency of the layout uh, does not uh, it doesn't give you a great example of, of how powerful this unit is. So we're going to go step by step and go through this. I'm just going to see if we have any critical questions coming in that I can answer first. So far it doesn't look like any, anyone's got any super pressing questions but I'll take a quick peek here. Amazing. Okay, cool. So I'm just going to quickly, all right, so I'll just quickly scan every once in a while just to make sure we don't, we're not missing any really important questions, but I will review these later and, and get at them as soon as I can. So um, when you open your V-Drums kit, set it up in your apartment or your studio space, your jam room or, or whatever you'd like, um, there is a ton of great stuff that you can do right outside the box. So you can see I've got kit number nine, Beechwood, uh, which reminds me of the first uh, really nice drum kit that I ever played on was a, a beach kit. So I, I kind of have a, there's a soft spot in my heart for this Beechwood kit. Really like the sound of that. Uh, if you just want to scroll through the different sounds, it's very simple. So you've got, you know, acoustic style sounds like here's kit number one, Premium Wood. I'll give you a quick sample of that.
So that's just a really nice, you know, pristine studio quality style acoustic drum set. And you've got some, uh, some more interesting sounds as well. You know, there's a lot of great effects, compression, EQ, reverb, all that kind of stuff in the module. So I will, uh, I'll get into some of that stuff later. But here's a kit called Compact Plus that does demonstrate some of the things like effects, like a filter and compression. So I'll play that a little bit for you. So there's a bunch of really cool stuff happening with that kit. There's a second set of hi-hats in place of the rack tom. You've got a tambourine layered on the hi-hat. So layering is another really cool thing I'm going to talk about later. And you've got some pretty heavy compression to, to give the kit this kind of smash, squished, in-your-face kind of sound. I'm going to skip ahead to kit number 22, which shows something really cool called mute grouping that I'll also discuss later. So this is called kick versus snare mute group. I'll play that for you. Cool, so again, so that's a kit that has some pretty extreme effects, some pretty extreme compression, and the kick and snare are mute grouped to each other, which is a really handy thing for running loops, which we'll talk about later. I'll just demonstrate a, a handful more of these patches for you, just to kind of give you an idea of what's in here. Of course, no rolling kit would be complete without the classic 808 and 909 samples that our drum machines are known for. So here's an 808 kit. So classic, classic 808 drum sound. So I'm seeing some, some questions come in here about, um, about recording. Please stick around. Recording is going to be a big component of this workshop. A little bit later on, we're going to get into the different ways you can record. And the cool thing about recording something like TD27, TD17, TD50, the newest line of V-Drums kits is that they're extremely easy to record and you can do so with minimal gear. So I'm going to talk about that in detail later, but I'll give you a really cool sort of uh, a preview of that. All you need is your V-Drums, a computer, and a USB cable. That's all you need to record this drum kit, which is really cool. So I'm seeing a couple other questions come here. Okay, so I'm seeing a question about double bass drum pedals. Yes, the KT-10 kick pad uh, on the on the TD-27 KV uh, is it, you, it will accommodate a double pedal. So whichever kind of pedal you're using, whatever brand of pedal you're using, whether it's single or double, you can clamp to this uh, this kick tower and it will work great. And that's true for, for pretty much all of the kick towers across the entire V-Drums line. They're designed to be universal with any pedal. So whatever pedal you're running, uh, you'll be able to use it with your V-Drums, which is really great. Cool, okay. So anyway, so that's just a, a brief look at some of the kits in this module. There are 55 onboard kits and then there are, are 44 more user kits, but any of those 99 kits can be customized. So you can create a new kit from scratch, or you can uh, edit one of the kits that's already there and, uh, and, and just custom tailor it to, to make more sense uh, for your playing style or the, the gig that you're playing. So I'm going to get into that a little bit right now. So let me just, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy a kit that I really like. So that's a really cool thing that's easy to do on the, uh, the TD27. So I'm gonna scroll to that, uh, let me find that, uh, that beach kit. So beach kit, beach wood, sorry, uh, number nine. So I have a kit edit button right here, which is really cool. That lets me go into the deep menu if I want to like really, really fine tune the performance of a specific drum kit or the, uh, the sound of a specific drum kit. But I'm going to get out of that for a second because if all I want to do is a, a quick adjustment to like the tuning, the level or the muffling or even the instrument type, I've actually got four knobs on the front of the module right there for that. So let's say uh, I'm not too crazy about this kick drum. I think it sounds great, but let's pretend I don't. I can just play the kick drum and then all I have to do is just turn this instrument uh, knob right here and I'm instantly changing, scrolling through the available kick drum sounds or the available sounds in general in the module. So I can just play that. I like that walnut kick. That sounds really good. So the really cool thing is any adjustments that I make here with this instrument knob, they are automatically saved. And when you use these four front knobs here, it automatically jumps back to your kit menu after a little while so you don't accidentally get stuck in that menu on a gig or during a session or something like that. So the same thing goes for level. Let's say the hi-hats are a little bit quiet. I can just play those, turn this level knob up, 
when I'm instantly adjusting the volume of the hi-hats. So I've also got a control for tuning. Let's say I want my floor tom a little bit lower in pitch. That's very, very easy to do. So I just play my floor tom and I turn my tuning knob. Okay, so like I said, all those really, really critical functions, muffling, tuning, the type of instrument that you're using, and the level of that instrument in the kit are instantly accessible from the front panel of the module. Okay, so that's great. But if I really, really want to fine tune things, I can go into this kit edit menu, which is fantastic. So the way it's laid out, I know it's a little bit hard to see on the screen here, but the editing parameters start at the transient, which is the initial impact of a sound. You know, if you're playing acoustic uh, drum, the, the moment the tip of your stick hits the head, that's a transient. And then when the instrument resonates, that's the body of the note. And then of course, there's the decay, there's the note trailing off. So I can start by editing the transient or the attack of a sound. Then I can go through and choose what instrument I'm using. I can change my pad volume. Uh, so those are some of the functions that are accessible on the front panel as well. Only in this, uh, in this menu, it doesn't automatically exit. So you're, you're safe and comfy in this menu if you want to do some deep editing. And then after that, I can send all of those individual sounds through EQ and compressors, so individually, and then also uh, in a, like a, basically like an EQ and compression bus for the whole kit. So I can EQ and compress my pads individually and then together at the end as a, as a whole, which is great. And then I've got my overhead and room uh, parameters, which are a brand new feature on the TD27. So the TD27 has a brand new ambience modeling program called Pure Acoustic Ambience. So that's simulated room sounds, and that's everything from you know the simulated uh, effect of playing in a bedroom, or a concert hall, or a cavern, or what have you. There are a ton of great presets that are all editable. And then you've also got overhead mic simulation as well. Uh, when you're you know recording an acoustic drum set, generally you're going to have spot mics on the kick, snare, toms, etc. And then you've got overhead mics, which primarily capture symbols, but also capture a picture of the whole kit. And that helps to kind of give you a nice unified sound. It collects the, the sound of the drum set as one instrument. So overhead mics are very important for collecting the entire sound of the drum set. So we've included that technology in here uh, with brand new algorithms for, you know, if you want a realistic sort of overhead approximation, you can have that. Or if you want something really bombastic in your overheads in your room, you can have that as well. Okay, cool. So I'm just seeing a couple really important questions come in here, so I'm going to address those. So I've got a question to turn up the USB stream volume if possible. I will do that. Okay, just going to do that a little bit. Let me know if that's okay. Would you consider the TD27 an upgrade from the TD30, says Frank. Frank, I absolutely think the TD27 is an upgrade. The TD30 is an incredible instrument, and you certainly won't be lacking anything in your playing experience when you're using a TD30. The pads are amazing, the module is amazing. Um, but the TD27 introduces a bunch of brand new features that the TD30 does not offer that are really great. So some of the things that we're going to talk about today are the ability to layer sounds and control how those layers work. Um, we're going to talk about using your own sounds, so you can import your own sounds into the TD27. You can't do that on the TD30. The TD27 offers a lot more comprehensive USB in and out as well. So we're going to talk about recording and triggering things from Ableton later. So you can do some of that with the TD30, but in terms of recording audio, uh, the, the TD27 is a lot more flexible and gives you a lot more control. Uh, you've got a brand new sound engine, and of course you've got the ability to use the CY18DR and, and PD140D which are digital pads, as I mentioned. So those connect to the module with the USB cable. The TD30 does not allow for that kind of pad. So like I said, the, the playing experience with the TD30 is amazing. It's going to feel great. It's going to sound great. But for recording, for live in and out purposes, for routing audio, for layering your own sounds or laying the internal sounds, for using digital pads, the TD27, as I mentioned, offers a lot of great new features. It also has Bluetooth. The TD30 doesn't have that. So the cool thing is the TD27 is backwards compatible with all previous Roland pads. So if you're playing a TD30 kit, you don't necessarily have to buy an entire TD27 KV. You could just plug all of your TD30 module, uh, TD30 pads, sorry, into the TD27 module and get all those new features without necessarily having to replace everything. Um, again, there you won't be getting the, the digital ride and snare, but that is an option for you if you want to upgrade your TD30 with a TD27 module. Okay, and I see one more question. I'm just going to quickly answer this. I swear I'm not checking random texts. Uh, is the TD17 capable of processing the data provided by the new ride symbol and snare? Uh, again, 
the TD17 uh, does not have USB pad inputs. The digital uh, CY18DR and PD140DS uh, pads do not connect with traditional quarter inch cables. So if you want to use these two pads, uh, the TD27 will accommodate them and the TD50 will accommodate them. So hopefully that answers all the really important questions so far. And again, I'm going to be checking out all of your comments later on after the stream. And if there's anything that I can't get to during the stream, I will answer your comment after the fact. So stay tuned there. Okay, so let's get into some of this kit editing that I was talking about. Okay, so we're still editing that beach kit. Let's say, um, let's say I'm pretty happy with how it sounds, but I want more attack on my kick and snare. So this is where that transient editor comes in. Okay, so I just use my arrow keys to select that, hit the enter button. Now I've got four controls for transient here. I can control the time, so how, m how long the attack is and, 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 and how long the attack lasts for. So that's not the entire sound, just the initial impact. So if I want a fatter attack, I can raise that. So there's my default setting of three. If I raise that to 10, that attack's a little bit fatter. So it's thicker, fatter, um, it's not quite as sharp, all right? And I can also, uh, uh, um, minimize the amount of attack or the length of the attack there. So the attack there is a little bit shorter. So I kind of liked it a little bit fatter. So I'm going to check that somewhere around eight for a bit of a fatter attack. Now I've got an actual value entitled attack. So now this is the amount of attack or the level of that attack. So I've lengthened my attack. And now, so I see what is the exact model name of the new ride. So the ride is CY18-DR. So uh, that's available with the TD27KV, with the uh, TD50, uh, any of the TD50 mod um, models, the K, the KV, the KVX, um, or it's available in the uh, TD50DP, which gives you the TD50 module, the PD140DS snare, and the CY18DR ride if you want the TD50 module and the digital pads to upgrade like an, uh, an old pads that you have, for example. Cool. Uh, Jeff Walderman says, you must be in sales. No, I'm not in sales. I actually just demonstrate products. I do tech support. So if you ever have any tech support questions, uh, I'm here for you. Reach out to Roland on our tribes forum and I will get to you. Okay, so uh, let's get back to editing the transient here. So I've lengthened my transient a little bit and because I want more attack, so that's where we're at now. I'm gonna raise my value from seven to, let's go extreme. Let's go all the way up to 54. So now that attack is a lot more present. Uh, the entire signal isn't louder. The body and the decay of the sound isn't louder, but the attack is. So I've created a, a much sharper initial impact. So it gives you the illusion of a louder hit, but the body and the decay of that sound won't clutter up the mix, for example, if I just want to cut through a little bit more. So that's what transient uh, editing is really great. If your sounds are not cutting enough or they're cutting too much, you can either increase or decrease the amount of, uh, of, of transient you have. And then the release is just how long that transient decays for. So if I increase the, 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 the release of that transient, now you can hear that initial impact gets dragged out a little bit more. So that's a little bit, I'm hearing a little bit too much overtone from that attack right now. Um, cool. So I'm gonna, oh, I'm saying yes. I did, I did in fact have my, uh, my, lav, um, my lav mic on. So I will, I will deactivate that for longer playing examples and stuff like that. I'll be mindful of that. Aubrey Rosenhack says, hey, if I have a troubleshooting issue with my TD-17, reach out uh, roland.ca and then go to our support page and find the tribes forums. Reach out to me there and I'll get to you with uh, your TD-17 questions, Aubrey. Okay, so uh, I found there was a little bit too much uh, too much uh, sustain or too much release on that transit. So I'm gonna back that down a little bit to uh, a value of 10. And I've also got a gain control here if I wanna actually boost the signal right from the, from the start. I don't really think I want to do that. So one thing I'm gonna to touch on here is in the lower right hand uh, corner of the screen, I've got a function called H and R. So you're gonna see this H and R um, on your TD-17, on your TD-50, on your TD-27. And basically H and R means if, uh, if, if you have H and R activated, it means any parameters or settings you change are going to apply, apply in, locks, in lock or, or together to the head and the rim of the drum. So if you're doing something like if you're just fine tuning the sound of your acoustic snare or your acoustic style tom on your V-Drums kit, you probably want to adjust these values together so that they're related to each other. But the cool thing is if, let's say you want, you know, super, super attacky drums, but you don't want all that extra attack on your rims, you can process those, those, process those separately. So all you do is press the little button, that's the F5 button underneath, and you can see that indicator is now off. So now I can change the transient 
uh, of my rim and my head separately. So for now, because I'm just going to quickly run you through some of these settings, I'm not going to go too deep into that there, but I'm going to show you some cool stuff you can do with head and rim later. So I've, uh, I've increased the, um, the attack of my snare, so it's a little bit punchier now. And I'm really going to quickly do the same thing for the kick. I'm going to turn my lav mic off. So I'm just going to quickly run through these three parameters, but with the lav mic off, so you can hear a better representation of the effect of these parameters. So I'm going to play my kick drum to select it and then deactivate my mic here. Okay, cool. So that's a bit more of a profound effect than what I what I did with the snare drum. Uh, the kick drum's got a lot more attack, a lot more punch. It's a lot more contemporary for your contemporary rock music or to cut through a pop mix. And I've uh, I've increase the release on that transient as well. So I've got a nice long fat attack with a little bit more decay, which is really nice. So that just feels good to me. So, oops, went a little bit too far there. So now if I go into my instrument selection, that's very similar to what I showed you earlier with the instrument knob. All I have to do to select an instrument is to play it and the screen will register the pad that I played. So if you want to do some deep editing, what I recommend is holding down the enter in the system button after you've selected a drum and that turns trigger lock on. So that way if I play a different drum, it doesn't select that drum. Trigger lock keeps uh, the, the, the drum that you've selected as the drum that you're editing until you press those buttons again to deselect. So that's a really important tool to have right there. So uh, again, I can, you know, if I want to adjust the level, the tuning, the muffling of this tom or change which tom sound I'm using, I can do that all from the front panel. But I also have a lot more control here if I hit this edit button. I can change the depth of my shell, I can change the type of head from a coated head to a clear head to a head with a ring. I can change how much snare buzz uh, uh, I'm getting so it's like a sympathetic vibration from the tom. I can have the tom activate the snare a lot for a more realistic sound or if I want like a nice clean signal I can deactivate that. I can change the pitch. I can change the pitch sweep. So again I'm, I'm not going to go absolutely crazy completely editing every single thing right here but I just want to give you a good sort of idea of, of how deep the editing on this kit is. You know if I select something like a, like a hi-hat symbol I can change the size of the symbol. Right now I've got these 15 inch session hi-hats. I can change them to be fixed if I don't want the hi-hat pedal to activate them. So you've got a lot of control over the sound. So that's one of the really cool things about the TD27 module is that it comes packed with over 700 sounds. So those are acoustic style sounds, electronic sounds, process sounds, there's uh, you know layer elements which I'll get into later. But the cool thing is even though you know you've got those 700 sounds, you're not limited to just those for a couple reasons. Number one is with deep editing you could turn one snare sample from this module into 15 snare sounds just by changing things like the pitch, the muffling, the depth of the shell, how much overtones there are, all that kind of stuff. So you've got a lot of control to fine tune and, uh, and customize um, your, your sound and your playing experience to fit your style. So what I do want to talk about really quickly right now is the layering function which is really cool. So I'm going to select my snare drum again. I'm going to trigger lock. I'll show you the module again here. So if I hit this uh, F4 button under the screen it says sub instrument over that. And then if I turn F1 on, now I've activated the sub instrument. So a sub instrument is a secondary instrument that you're going to layer on top of the main instrument. So this is really cool for bolstering an acoustic style sound or a sound that you've already got assigned to a kit. Um, and, it's, and you've got a lot of control over the playability of this kind of thing. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start with something a little bit more traditional. Like let's say I like the snare sound. Here it is. But I want a little bit more fatness. So I've, I've turned my sub layer on. Now I'm going to scroll up here. I'm going to select my bank of snare sounds. So I don't have to scroll through every single sound. I can just pick a snare sound by selecting the instrument bank over top of the instrument number. And I'm going to scroll down here. I'm just going to keep my lab mic on for a second just to give you, just so I don't have to switch back and forth here. But I'm going to scroll through these other snare sounds that I've now layered over top. So I've got my original beach snare on there, but now I've layered a steel open snare on there. And right now I have those on as layer type mix, which is really cool. Um, 
Uh, that just means both samples always play together. I can also change that to fade, which is really cool if I want to do something a little bit less conventional. So now I'm going to go back to my instrument bank and I'm going to select claps, okay? So I'm going to select, uh, I'm just going to pick and let me turn this up a little bit. I want this clap a little bit louder. So this sub instrument, you have all the controls that you would have for your regular or your main instrument. You can control those as well. You can go in and change the pitch and the decay and all that. And you can change the, uh, the level of that sub instrument independently from the level of the main instrument. So I'm gonna go back into that sub instrument. I'm gonna find myself a clap here. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, nice techno clap. That's pretty cool. Someone says, does the TD-20 have USB terminals? The TD-20 will not accommodate the US. The, the, only, the only pads, sorry, the only modules that will accommodate the digital pads are the TD-27 and the TD-50 modules. And I see, okay, layerings. Uh, so Steven is asking about layering only on the TD-27. No, you can layer on the TD-17, you can layer on the TD-27, you can layer on the TD-50. And if you're using hybrid gear for your live setup, you can layer with um, SPDSX, with SPD1 Wave, with a TM6 Pro module. So there are a lot of pieces of gear that do the layering. Now, if you have an older module that doesn't allow you to layer in the module, you can get around this with a computer, so we'll get into that later. But let's get back to using this clap. So right now, if I play with this uh, clap layer always activated, it's gonna sound like this. So it's a really great clap sound, but it's sort of cluttering up my performance because it's always there. So if I scroll down with this arrow button and select layer type, I can change my layer type to fade one, fade two, fade three. So th this is just a different fade curve. And what fade curve means is that instead of always being active, that secondary layer is going to activate at a certain velocity. So I'm gonna set mine to fade two, which is a bit more of a gradual fade. And I'm gonna change my fade point or the velocity level that my second layer is gonna kick in at. I'm gonna raise that up to something like 75, which just from previous trial and error, I know is a pretty good uh, uh, level for me. So now, if I play that, the clap won't be present on my ghost notes. Okay. So that's a really cool thing that you can do with layering. So have that clap just kick in on the uh, higher velocity stroke. So you've got clap on your back beats, but not on your ghost notes. So you get a nice authentic, uh, you know, sort of like nuanced playing experience, but all that modern power of a clap on your back beats. So there is one more um, layer type that's really cool. So there's your mix where both layers are always present. Three fade curves, so, uh, you know, fade one, the sample is just going to kick in at a certain velocity. Fade two, it's going to fade in at that velocity. And fade three is a bit more of a drastic fade. There is also a third mode called switch, which is really cool for sort of more creative ideas. So I'm going to go back to module view here so you can see what I'm doing. We're going to go back down to that sub instrument and I'm going to change my layer type to switch. So I'm going to keep the velocity the same. So I'm still at that same velocity and uh, check what happens if I play this pad now. Okay, so when I play after that certain velocity, 65 that I've set here, it switches from my main sound to my layered sound. So that might not make a lot of sense if you're playing an acoustic style performance, but you know, if you're playing electronica, you'll probably notice, you know, most producers will program hi-hat parts that you need three hands to play. So you could put one set of hi-hats on your hi-hat, another set of hi-hats on your ride cymbal, and uh, a third set of hi-hats on your snare drum. Actually, let's do that for a second, just for fun. So let me just find something a little bit more electronic sounding here. So what's this, uh, let's, uh, let's go for Ultra D and B. This is cool. Okay, so D and B sounds. All right, so I've got a ride, I've got hi-hats, I've got snare, that's pretty cool. But just to show you how easy and quick it is to customize these things, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna do that right now. So for my hi-hat symbol, I'm gonna, or sorry, my ride symbol, which I'm gonna turn into a hi-hat, I'm gonna hit it, trigger lock to the ride. Uh, I'm gonna turn my sub-instrument on, because off, because I've got a sub-instrument that I don't want on there. I'm gonna show you the module now. Um, so 
Uh, I've turned this sub layer off, so it's just a ride symbol. Again, I'm going to go up and select my uh, sound bank. I'm going to scroll back from hi hats or from rides to hi hats. I'm going to choose something random here. Let's see. TR808 hi hat. That's kind of cool. 909, bit more tech or a bit more decay. Let's uh, let's go with the 808. I'm going to leave this hi hat the way it is, and I'm going to do something crazy with this snare drum here. Okay, so. Uh, right now, I've got Walnut Light set as my main snare sample. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here. I'm going to change my snare sound to a hi hat. So let me scroll through the banks, find a hi hat, turn the sub instrument off. Okay, so now my snare is making a hi hat sound. Okay, which I don't really want if I'm going to play a traditional groove. Let's hear, you know, see what that sounds like. Probably not great. Okay, so in its current state, this kit isn't really playable for grooves. It's uh, Stuart Copeland's dream. It's all hi-hats, you know, but uh, it's not really going to work for what we're doing here. So I'm going to go back to this screen where I turn the sublayer off, and I turn the sublayer on the snare back on. Right now it's set to mix mode. I don't want that. I don't want to always hear the snare. I'm going to change it to switch mode, and I'm going to change again. I'm going to maybe raise my, uh, my switch value a little bit higher. Let's go for something like uh, 80 or 85 right now. Okay, so I've got two sounds on my snare. I've got a hi-hat layered at the lower velocities, and then a snare layered at the higher velocities. Okay, so the cool thing is I can play my ghost notes but get a hi-hat sound. And the really cool thing is any of your hi-hat sounds across the kit are going to be affected by the pedal. So if I open my hi-hat pedal, I get three sets of open hi-hats. Okay, so let's hear what this sounds like with this uh, layer switch mode on the snare. Jojo Mayer is rolling in his grave somewhere. Well, he's not in a grave, but uh, he's, he's, rolling, he's rolling on his couch right now because he's locked at home like the rest of us. Um, anyway, so that's a really cool thing that you can do with this, uh, this velocity switch mode. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about practicing in a second because that's really important to me, but I want to show you a really cool thing that you can do with this velocity switch mode. So when, um, uh, when you're in this mode, like I said, it's going to switch over a certain velocity. So if you want to work on controlling your dynamics, if you want to work at you know, playing at a lower register or playing at a lower volume. This is a really fun way of doing that. So I can set, you know, my switch velocity wherever I want and then I can play and let's say my goal is to never activate that snare sound. Okay, so at the end those last two hits were a little bit hard. I can also work on, you know, creating great contrast between my accents and my ghost notes, for example, by trying to make sure I always fire the snare sound when I want to and never when I don't. Cool. So again, you know, if you want to just sort of like bolster the sound of a kit that you're playing or the sound of a kit that you've created, layering is a great way to do that. If you want to sort of just, you know, like add some contemporary uh, production or percussion elements to uh, your acoustic style performance, like putting that clap on your snare drum, which is all over the radio these days, you can do that. Um, and then, you know, you can get us some pretty creative stuff using, using uh, either that fade mode or using switch mode. And then switch mode kind of makes a great dynamic practice exercise as well. So the cool thing is you can layer any sound over top of any sound. So one of the things that I do want to talk a little bit about now um, is the ability to, to layer in your own samples. So, um, actually I'm going to show you this. So this is an SD card. It's fantastic, it's quick, it's stable, and it goes right into the side of my TD27 module. So the cool thing about the TD27 and the SD card is that you've got a lot of great functions accessible from the SD card. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to import a snare sample that I created. I'm going to show you a little bit more about creating samples layer later. Hey! Freudian slip because I'm going to talk about layering again in a second. Um, so I'm going to import a sample. I'm going to talk about making them later, but I'm going to talk about importing them right now. And that's one of the great things that you can do with the TD-17, the TD-27, and the TD-50 is you can layer your own samples right into the module. They get saved onto the module and you can apply them to any part of the kit that you want. And that's the cool thing about layering. 
any sound can be layered over any sound. And uh, like I was mentioning before, you can either apply these sounds in layers to the head and the rim together or separately. So on one pad, you can have up to four sounds, for example, a primary and a secondary sound on the head and a primary and secondary sound on the rim. So, you know, even if you don't have tons and tons of pads, you can have tons of sounds across the kit and you can use them traditionally or you can get crazy and creative with it. Okay, I'm seeing a couple questions come here. Can the pitch of a sound be controlled by that velocity? That's a great question. So in the module, um, no. <laughs> um, there's a pitch bend where the pitch is affected by how much you push down the hi-hat, which is pretty cool. Um, but the pitch of the sound controlled by velocity is something that you could do in uh, some, some audio software, like sampling software, VST, after the fact, but you cannot do that in the module. But that's a really cool thing to maybe look into for the future. Thank you for that question. Topher, what's up? Um, okay, cool. So. Uh, like I said, the idea of, of importing your own user samples is really cool because it means if you've got a great recording of your favorite snare drum, you can put it in your V-drums and have access to that sound whenever you want. Or if, you, uh, if you're working with an artist and you're going to be using some or a you know, V-drums kit or some V-drums elements live, you can get their sounds from their record and play them live, which is really cool. Um, layering is really important for this because the way sample importing works, uh, you're importing a single wave file. Um, and you might remember earlier today, I mentioned the Prismatic Sound Engine. So the Prismatic Sound Engine is the sound engine that takes a whole bunch of snare samples of just one drum and combines them and plays them back in, in, in you know, different sequence and in different order depending on the velocity and the position of your strokes. So that's why when you play a V-Drums kit and you play ghost notes and flams and all that stuff, you get a really nuanced and articulate sound. If I do that with just a single wave file, I'm not going to get the same playability because it's not, oh, a whole bunch of different samples of the same drum. It's one, so it will, it will play back at different volumes, but I'm not gonna get that tonal change where it's more hollow sounding at the edge or fatter and puncher in the middle. So let me demonstrate that right now. So I'm gonna go into, so I put the SD card in the side of the, uh, of the TD-27. Uh, so importing your own samples is really, really easy. There's a button right on the module called user sample. I hit that, so that's my sort of sample uh, importing suite right here. So there's a button on the side that says import. All I have to do is press enter. And any of the sounds that I have on my, um, on my uh, SD card are shown here. So I can see folders and I can see things in the root folder as well. So I've got um, uh, a file here called bond snare. Okay, you guys might recognize the snare sound. Okay, so I've selected that with this dial. I hit the select button to tell it that I want to import that sound. And then I find an open slot in the module's memory and then hit import. So to get the sample from my SD card to the module, it takes like maybe 10 seconds, you know, faster if you've, if you've done it a bunch of times, you know exactly what you're doing. So I can preview that sound right from this menu just to hear what that sounds like. All right, so I'm gonna hit preview. Let's hear what that bond snare sounds like. Boom. You guys know Gear Maker? That's, uh, I think it's the seventh or maybe eighth hit in the fill at the beginning of Gear Maker by Led Zeppelin. So that's a, a legendary snare sound if there ever was one, okay? So I'm gonna go back into, okay, we're on a kit called Heavy Rock. I mean, that sort of makes sense. Let's see what this sounds like. So those are pretty big, pretty punchy. Let me find like a bottom kind of sounding. Okay, Rocky Road 70s Live. Let's hear this kit. Okay, cool. So it maybe doesn't have all that Headley Grange reverb, but uh, it's a nice, you know, 70s live boomy kind of sounding kit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into my kit edit menu and where I selected instruments before, you know, to change the snare sound or to change the kick drum sound or whatever, I can select all of my user samples from this menu as well. Okay, so I'm going to play my snare drum. I'm going to make sure I've got that trigger lock on so I don't accidentally put this bottom snare on a tom because that would be crazy but maybe kind of cool if you, uh, if you feel so inclined. So here's what it sounds like if I put the, uh, the bond snare or this, uh, this Jure Maker snare on the snare drum. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through my user sounds. Again, I can get right to my user sound bank with the, um, uh, the bank selection, and then it's a lot easier and a lot quicker than scrolling through all of the available sounds. So user sound three, I've got my bond snare here. So let's hear what that sounds like if I just play this snare the way I've assigned it to the kit in sort of like a vanilla way.
cool. Okay, so that's the Bonham snare sound. It's the sound of his, you know, Ludwig snare and, and, and him playing it, but it's a little flat and it's responding kind of funny. So there are a couple reasons for that. So the first thing that I want to do is make sure that my user sample type is correct, which I probably should have done earlier, but I'm going to do it now. So beside Bond snare, I've got a sample play type right here. So right now it's called one shot mono. Okay. So mono means that only one instance of that sound will play at a time. So if I hit the snare and then hit the snare again, the second hit will cancel out the first. So if you're trying to replicate like an electronic style performance of, you know, someone programming something on an 808 or a, 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 an MPC or something like that, that might give you a more authentic sort of electronic or sample style sound. But for acoustic drums, you know, hitting a, a drum doesn't necessarily cancel out the first sound. It does change it, but you know, drums are polyphonic because the sound waves bounce around the room and off different surfaces. So I'm going to change my sample play type in this menu. So I just, you know, arrow over to it very easily, use the dial here, and now I've changed it to poly mode. Okay. So poly, uh, poly samples will play multiple instances of themselves over, to, over top of each other. So let's hear what that sounds like now. It's like I tripped over my own shoelaces there. Okay, so anyway, so now the response to the drum is a little bit better, but it doesn't have that crisp, nuanced, subtle detail I expect from a V drums module, because that's what you get with V drums. You get subtle subtlety, you get nuance, and you get a very, very detailed playing experience. And I'm not getting that right now. So this is where the layering comes in. Okay, so I'm gonna go back into my kit menu. Uh, I'm gonna go back into my instrument selection. I'm going to select that snare drum, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to select one of the internal sounds as my primary layer, okay? Because I want those multi samples that I'm getting from the prismatic sound engine. I want all of those, you know, uh, ghost notes and drags and buzzes, and I want the tonality to change as I move around the head. So I'm going to ch I'm going to choose one. It's called Steel Fat Snare. Sounds like this. All right, so that's a little bit high pitch for Bonham. I see some questions coming in here. Is that Bond Snare sample available for download? So that one I made this morning. I'm going to show you how to do that later. There are tons and tons of samples available for download on the internet. Either, you know, there are sites that have free samples. There are sites that have sample packs that you buy. Uh, if you buy some audio software, like recording software, sampler software, they usually come with a sample bank. Um, so that particular one I made, and I'm going to show you how to do that later, okay? But what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to show you how to sort of mix my snare, my Bond snare, or the John snare, I guess, and, and layer it on top of one of the internal sounds to give it a more playable sound and more playable response. So right now, this, this steel fat snare is just like, it's, it's just a little bit too, too high pitch for me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna change my tuning. Okay, so that's a little bit lower pitched. It's ringing a little bit too much for me. So again, I know right now I've got the mic on, so you're hearing me hit the pads. I'll give you a better sample of this in a second. I'm gonna muffle it just a little bit so it doesn't ring it quite as long. So the, what I love about the V-Drums kits is the muffling, uh, it's not a value. It's not zero to one to two to three. It's tape one, tape two, tape three, donut. So if you're coming to the V-Drums from an acoustic kit, you know, you're used to putting tape on your drums or an O-ring to muffle them. This is going to respond the same way. So that's what I love about this. So I'm going to change it to maybe tape three. Um, okay, so that's cool. So that's a little bit closer now to the, uh, the bottom sound that I'm looking for. So if I play this drum the way it is, so this is just an internal sound, not with my sample on it. Cool, okay, that's responding nicely now. If I play quiet ghost notes near the edge, I get a light, hollow sound. If I nail a rim shot, I get a fat, punchy sound. So I'm getting a different response sonically, depending on what I play in terms of my performance and my technique. So I still want that bottom snare though. It's not quite bottomy, bottomy, bottomy enough for me. So I'm gonna go back into my kit edit mode instrument and I'm going to apply that bond snare as my sub layer. Okay, so got my snare selected going to turn sub layer on, scroll through the sound banks to user sample, and user sample three was that bond snare. Now I'm going to change my, my layer type, sorry, from mix to fade, so it's not always present and it only kicks in on the higher velocities. So I'm going to choose fade two, fade three, so that 
um, fade to rather, so that after that uh, velocity, the sound does still fade in. So that'll give me, again, a bit more of a realistic response. So I'm gonna change my, my fade point to maybe 70, somewhere nice and in the middle. And now let me play that for you with both sounds layered together. Okay, so now I've got that bottom snare on this Rocky Road kit, and now I can play it the way I normally play, because I love ghost notes, I love double strokes, I love all that stuff. It's uh, stu super fun. Judah says, need to get back to work, and what I'm looking for hasn't started. Oh, hey, Steve Travis, what's up, Trapper? How's it going, man? Okay, so Judah, uh, the recording part will, uh, will come, so uh, check back on Long McQuaid's Facebook page, this whole video will be there and we're going to get into the recording. Uh, I've just got a logical flow of ideas here that we're going to work with. So we will get the information to you um, and you'll be able to, to view it at your convenience. So thanks for tuning in while you did. Okay, um, so I know I'm seeing lots of comments coming here. I'm going to get to this stuff as soon as I can. So anyway, so that's just a brief look at layering. Okay, so you can go crazy and layer, you know, one sound on your head, one on your rim, all this stuff and, you know, really custom customize and, and create a new playing experience for yourself. I want to really quickly go back into the kit edit mo menu just to show you some of the other really cool things. Uh, like I was saying again, you've got uh, EQ and compression for different pads, so I can go in and uh, I've got a three band EQ uh, for, you know, that I can apply to each pad individually. So if I want to boost the low end in the toms and, and cut the low end in the cymbals or, or whatever, I can do that. I can also compress different pads individually. Um, and then I can go in and custom tailor the room ambient. So that's really cool. I'm just gonna give you a couple playing examples. So, um, so I'm gonna keep it on, uh, actually let me, uh, let me switch to a different kit here. I'm gonna switch to, switch to kit number two, Studio A, okay? So part of what makes kit st two, Studio A sound the way it does is the overhead and the room simulation, okay? So I'm gonna start with those off, okay? So I'm gonna deactivate my overhead simulation. I'm gonna deactivate my room simulation and I'm gonna play a little bit for you. Actually, I've got an idea. Let's, uh, so, I'm gonna, okay, sorry, all right, so I'm gonna play for you. Okay, so now if I turn my overhead mic simulation on, my room simulation on, now those really nice sounding individual samples are gonna blend together and it'll sound more like a kit in an acoustic space, which if you're coming at this instrument from the acoustic perspe perspective, you're used to hearing. Cool, 80 stick spin for added effect. So now, again, you know, the, the instrument sounds on their own are really, really great, you know, beautiful sounding acoustic style drums, but now I've added that uh, pure acoustic ambience technology for a more authentic sound and response. And like I was saying, you can go really crazy with this stuff. Like, for example, let me go in, and uh, right now I've got room, my room type set up as, a, as small studio one. So let me choose, let's choose, uh, let's go crazy here, let's go middle hall. Okay, so now I've got my drums in a really big room. So just like the instrument sounds are, are, you know, infinitely customizable, your ambient sounds are also infinitely customizable, which is really, really cool. So again, I'm not, I'm just sort of touching on the things here, you know, um, the, the various parameters that you have in terms of changing your sound and customizing your sound, but there's a whole bunch of stuff in this module that's amazing. But again, um, a lot of these features, things like changing your, you know, the the depth of your shell or the type of head or how much snare wire is being activated by either the snare drum or by sympathetic re resonance. A lot of those functions and parameters are available in your TD-17, your TD-50, your TD-11, your TD-9, etc. So if you haven't jumped into the, uh, the kit menu, 
please do. The cool thing is it's not destructive, like you can't change anything in the module um, irreversibly. Um, but they all come with sort of like user kits uh, that are you know, unconfigured or minimally configured, and that's what those are there for, for you to sort of like create your own uh, custom experience, which is really cool. Okay, so I just want to talk a little bit more about the module. Um, you know, I've touched on sort of like the the sounds, the 700, over 700 sounds. So those are sounds that come from the TD50 library, the TD17 library, the TM6 Pro module library. Uh, there are new, new sounds as well. There's the new pure acoustic ambience. Um, but there's a lot of other really, really great stuff. So I mean, we're all, you know, stuck at home right now. We're at home more often than we would be. We're not out gigging with our bands or practicing with our bands or writing with our friends the way we were before. Um, we've got all this extra time to practice, which is amazing. You know, it's been so fantastic being able to come into you know, my room, make my coffee in the morning and flick on my V-drums and, and work on whatever I want to work on, you know, whether it's something, you know, important for being a better musician like time and dynamics or I just want to throw on like a crazy tune and just jam out. It's a lot of fun. So. The cool thing is the uh, the TD27 has a lot of features that are really really great for practicing. And again, a lot of these functions, so like the onboard metronome, coach functions, you're going to find these on most VDrums modules. Um, but one of the really cool things about the TD27 is that the uh, your ability to play along to music is 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 very easy to access. And uh, you've got a lot of options for that. So I'm seeing a couple questions come in here. I'm a guitarist by trade, but would love to learn on a rolling kit. Is there a training mode built into the new TD27 drum module? This is perfectly timed. That's exactly what I'm going to talk about. So the TD27 makes it very easy to play along to music. There's an onboard metronome to work on your internal sense of time. And there is, in fact, a coach mode, which gives you different, you know, sort of games or, or warm-up exercises to help you be a better drummer. So excellent timing on that question. And I see one more here. Let's see what this other question is. Cool. Is that... Oh, that's just the bond snare question. Never mind. Okay, so Shane, that is exactly what we're going to talk about right now. So I'm going to jump over to module mode right here. So all of the sort of like practice functions are instantly accessible from the front of the module. If I want to turn my click on, I hit the click button. I can select my tempo immediately. I've got menus to change, you know, the sound of my metronome, how many beats per bar, the type of subdivision, the, uh, the source gain of the metronome. I've got a tap tempo function that I can assign to a certain pad. So if I want my kick drum to generate the tempo, I can do that. Um, Etc. So I've got a lot of control over how the metronome sounds, how it plays. So I'm just going to turn it on right now, and I'm going to turn this backing volume down all the way because that controls your playing along music, your metronome. I just did want to blast your eardrums with a click right away because it's not the most pleasant sound if you're not playing along to it. So let's turn that volume up. So that's a really cool thing. If you are practicing or playing along to some music, it's very easy, very quick to turn that music up or down in relation to the drums. So that backing volume, of course, does not affect the volume of your drums, just the click track or the play along music. So I'm not really crazy about the sound, so I'm just going to scroll in, scroll over, change it to, I think my favorite is called Woodblock. Yeah, Woodblock. This is a little bit more pleasant for me. So. Um, this is a, a more pleasant metronome sound, so I can set this again, like I said, to uh, to whatever whatever tempo I'd like, and you know, if I want to change it to like a five beat phrase or something like that, I can do that. Um, so that's kind of the most important way to improve as a drummer is to work on your time, all right? So just turn this on, play along. Oh, let me turn that mic off. Okay, so that's playing with a metronome, which is great. I mean, you know, you can do that, play in the moment, whatever you're working on, whatever tempo you're shooting for, practice that. One of the other really cool things that you can do very, very easily with the, uh, the TD27 module is record yourself. Okay, so I'm going to get out of that click menu for a second and hit this recording button, which is, opens up my recording function, which is really great, really flexible. There's a lot of really cool stuff that you can do with it. So I can choose to either have my recording target be all, so it's going to capture that metronome, it's going to capture whatever music I'm playing along to, or I can set it to drums only, okay? So if I want to record an idea to listen to later or to send to a friend either through USB or through an SD card, I'll probably record drums only so you know my songwriting friends don't have to hear the metronome. But for practice purposes, I might want to leave that click on because it's a lot easier to sort of hear yourself objectively if you're listening after the fact. So I can, you know, start my click, 
I'll start that back up, go back to my recording. I've got it set to all so it will capture the click as well. And then I can record. Cool. Okay. So now, you know, I can listen back to that later, hear myself with the click, and then judge, you know, if I'm rushing or dragging or whatever. So that's really a handy thing. And then anything that you record can be exported to an SD card directly, you know, from the module if you've got an SD card plugged in, um, or you can send it out to your computer to record into a computer or something like that. So one of the other, one of the other practice functions that the, t the TD27 has built right in are some, you know, internal songs. Um, so you can, can you can choose whether you're playing along to, to songs from your SD card or the internal songs. So I've got some internal songs here. Here's one called, uh, let's go to the pop one. Let's see what that sounds like. So these are songs that play along songs that are built right into the module. Cool, okay. So that just gives you an idea of, you know, playing along to music. But the cool thing is, if you have some songs loaded onto your SD card, in addition to the internal songs, so there are, I think there are, um, you've got, you know, six internal songs, different styles, funk, rock, pop, metal, jazz, etc. But if you have a song on your SD card, you can play the song from your SD card. So I'm going to give you a quick example of that. I'm not going to play along for a second because I'm going to show you some really cool things that you can do uh, in terms of practicing along to music. So let me just start this song here. Cool, okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit over this. So this is a song called MVA. Uh, it's a song by my friend Joseph of Mercury, an artist that I work with. He's a great songwriter, a great performer, so check him out. Um, so what I've, what I've got is I've got his song playing right here. But if I show you the module, again, I know it's not super easy to see the, the, the lettering on the screen, but I've got this AB function right here, okay? So that's basically a looper for whatever music that you're listening along to or playing along to. So let's say there's a particularly difficult piece of music or part of a piece of music that you want to practice. You can press the button once to select your start point, again to select your end point, and then the song player will loop that section of music. So let me just give you a quick example of that without playing along. Okay, so you can hear that that one section, I ended up settling on the word younger by accident there. Um, but, uh, but that A and B function, you know, that works to loop a section of music. So all you have to do is just press it on a downbeat, press it on another downbeat, and it will loop perfectly. So the other thing that's really cool about playing along to music from your SD card or the internal song is that you can change the speed, okay? So if I just, you know, move my uh, selection down with these arrow buttons to the speed button, I can play that piece of music. So So obviously playing along slower is a really, really great way to develop, again, your internal sense of time to make sure that you're hearing the space between the notes, to play more accurately and that kind of thing. Um, you know, generally playing faster doesn't make you better at something, but, you know, maybe you've been playing the song for three years and you're bored of it and, you know, juicing up the speed will make it more interesting. But that's a cool thing that you can do with the, either the internal songs or songs on your SD card is you can loop sections or you can slow them down or speed them up for practice purposes. So that's a really, really great thing. So there are a few other ways to play along to music with the TD27. So you can play music right from your SD card. You can play the internal songs. Um, if you have uh, a cable like this, you know, so this terminates, it's a, an eighth inch stereo cable that goes to a quarter inch stereo cable. There's an audio input on the back of the module that you can plug that into. So if you want to plug an MP3 player or your phone or your tablet or the headphone output of your computer into the module, you can do that um, just to play along directly. And any of the sounds, anything that you're either generating from your performance, any of the audio that you're running through the module, so that could be sounds from the SD card, sounds from the AUX input, you know, if you've got your cable plugged in, uh, songs that you're playing along to through Bluetooth, anything can be routed through any of the outputs. So that's something I'm going to get into a little bit more later, but 
the TD27 has multiple outputs. There's a stereo headphone output, there's a stereo master output, and there is uh, two direct outputs as well. And everything is routable through those. So if you want to send your drums, for example, through the master output, and then take a monitor feed from your front of house engineer at a live gig, you can take that feed right into your module and hear your monitor feed in your ears without having that monitor feed go through the master out. So you can route you know, that monitor feed just to the headphones and then the drums to the headphones and the master output. Now let's say, um, let's say you know, uh, the last venue you played didn't have subs or bass bins and now you're playing a venue that does have subs or bass bins and the bass drum is just too loud, you know? There are a few ways you could just sort of deal with that. You know, you could very easily go in and, you know, just play your kick drum, change the level, make it quieter. You could go into your kit edit menu, maybe like EQ some of the low end out, that kind of thing. Or if you are lucky enough to be working with a front of house engineer, someone that's mixing the band from out front, you could route the kick through output one, the snare through output two, all the other drums and cymbals through the master output, and then you can route your incoming audio to your headphones. Now you've got a monitor feed coming from the board. You're sending the sound engineer kick separately, snare separately, and then a mix of the kit. So now they've got a lot more control to mix things. And you can set all those inputs and outputs to either be pre-fader or post-fader. So you can either send him the same volume levels that you're hearing, or you can send him kick and snare before your volume. So he's got more headroom without you having to hear too much kick or snare in your headphones. So that's a really, really cool thing about all incoming and outgoing audio is everything can be routed how you want through those inputs and outputs. So again, you know, at home, if you're just playing along to music through the aux input or from your SD card or through Bluetooth or something like that, um, you could just write everything to your headphones and not have to worry about it. But if you want to use the TD27 for a live gig, you've got a lot of flexibility for sending and receiving audio. So one of the other things that I want to talk about that's, that's pretty cool is the Bluetooth function. So I don't have my phone paired with the module currently because I don't want to get a phone call and for you guys to have to listen to it. Um, so I'm just going to really quickly pair um, my phone with the module. So the Bluetooth in the TD27, which is also available in the TD2017 KV uh, and KVX, um, will receive audio so you can stream music from your phone or tablet um, and it will send and receive MIDI if you're using some sort of application that that allows for MIDI through Bluetooth. So we'll talk about audio and MIDI later but let's talk about streaming right now. So I mean it would be you know I could just you know go into Spotify we should be connected here with Bluetooth. I'm just going to go onto my system so I've got uh, you know a, a Bluetooth menu right here. I'm going to go to pairing so my, my module is now looking for my phone. I'm just going to quickly go into my phone settings, connections. Sorry, you're going to listen to me play around with Bluetooth. Going to connect to the TD27 audio. OK, cool. So now I'm connected. You can see that the pair is successful. OK, cool. So I see Brett, Brett Brokoy. I, I know Brett. We've talked before. We have talked before. OK, Brett, I'm going to show you how to get this snare sample later. So I'm just going to open up Spotify, and I'm just going to pick something random here. Oh. oh, it's playing MVA, because I was sampling that into my SD card earlier. OK, let me find something different here. OK, so now I'm just streaming music from my phone. Anyone check out Mark Giuliana? He's a monster drummer. This is a record he played on called Now Versus Now. Very cool. Anyway, so if I wanted to really challenge myself, I could play along to that song through Bluetooth. But let me show you something else that's really cool that you can do with your audio input, with your Bluetooth, with recording. So I'm going to take a little segue away from this whole concept of using the TD27 to practice. We talked about playing along to music, obviously vital for practicing. We talked about the click track. I'm going to talk about the coach functions in a second, but this is a really fun thing that you can do, okay? So my, uh, my phone, I'm going to activate my voice recorder here, okay? I'm going to take out this wacky instrument. Okay, so this is called, a, if, any, if anyone's not familiar with this, it's called a melodica. It's sort of like a breath activated keyboard instrument. I'm sure uh, someone would be able to describe that better for me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just play something, and it's probably not going to be very good because I'm pretty much just a drummer, but I'm going to record it into my phone really quickly. So check this out. One, two, three, four. Okay, so that is a very horribly played little two-chord example. 
Okay, so I'm going to save that recording. So now it's on my phone, but because I've got my phone uh, connected to the module by Bluetooth, if I've got my recording target in my recording suite set to all, I can actually record the audio from my phone right into the module, and then I can save that to an SD card, which is kind of cool. So let me just play this, uh, this sample back from my phone from the beginning. Oh, sorry. That's my bad. I've still got my song going. Let me let me turn the song off here. Sorry, not with song. Okay. Okay. Sorry. My bad. Etc. Okay, so let me stop that. We'll stop this. Let's just listen to what that recording sounds like. All right, cool. So that's me playing the melodica horribly, but here's a cool thing. I can export this. I'm going to hit enter to confirm that I want to export it. So now it's on my SD card, and a really cool thing that I can do is I can go in, go to user sample, go to import. Now, in my recording folder, that recording has now shown up, so I can preview that. And the cool thing is, now I've got that, or I should import it. I didn't import it. I told you I could import it, but I didn't import it. Okay. So it's going to go down, select, find an open slot, import. So you probably wouldn't want to do this with a horribly played melodica example, but the cool thing is, without having to go into software, you can create samples right from the kit itself. So now I can go, I'm just going to pick a, a blank user kit here. I can go to my kit edit, my instrument menu, and for some reason, if I want that sound on my crash, I can have it. So let's hear what that sounds like. Oh. Okay, so not a great example of something that you would want to sample. But that whole process, even with me making a couple mistakes, is maybe like a minute and a half long. So I'm just, you know, taking audio through Bluetooth into the module, saving it onto an SD card, and then re-importing it as a user sample. So I can go in and, and change the, the start and end, entry point. I can clean up that, the beginning and ending of that sample. So even without using a computer or other sampling gear, you can record samples right into the TD27, which is really cool. So I'm just going to unpair my phone here so you guys don't have to hear phone calls or anything like that come in. Um, uh, but that's a really great way to practice is you can play along to music through Bluetooth. Okay, so the last thing that I want to show you in terms of practice functions is the coach mode here. So this is something that I was talking about earlier. So coach mode is basically just warm up exercises in the module that will help you be a better drummer. So the first one is my favorite. It's called time check. So I open the, the, the program up and I've got a few different con controls here. Um, I've got a setup mode. I can change how long the exercise is, how many bars or how many measures it is, whether it's 4, 8, 16, 32 bars. Let's choose a, an 8 measure uh, exercise. And you've got easy and hard modes. I'm going to change it to hard mode because I want to challenge myself. And I can choose which instrument is being displayed, which is also which instrument is being judged, basically. So I'm going to leave my kick and my snare as the instruments that are being displayed. So now, if I go to time check and I hit my start button, I'll get uh, a couple bars of click uh, pre-roll, where that's basically you know uh, a count in before the exercise starts, and then it will grade each of my kick and snare drum hits in terms of how close they are to the metronome, whether they're ahead or behind of the beat. So not only does it score my performance and give me sort of like a tangible number that I can use as a, as a good starting point to sort of improve upon, um, but I can also actually see exactly on the screen how uh, my playing is lining up against a click, whether it's ahead or behind. So let me just give you a quick, quick example of that. I'm going to turn this mic off. <laughs> Comedy of errors here. Let me get out of the kit with the, the melodica on the snare drum. <laughs> Sorry, that was hilarious. Uh, so let's go back and coach. Let's try that again.
Okay, so during the exercise, I could see that the majority of my hits were ahead. I'm all excited, so I'm playing ahead of the beat, and my finishing score is 49 out of 100, which is not very good. But the cool thing is, I could see that my playing was inconsistent because it was ahead of the beat by a long shot. So now what I can do is retry, and because I know that I was ahead of the beat, I can physically and mentally try to relax a little bit more so that I'm not quite as far ahead of the beat. So let's try it one more time. Okay, 90. Now I feel good about myself. So th again, like I said, you know, I, I the first time was not a great result. I was excited, I wasn't focused, etc. So I was ahead of the beat. I could see that on the graph and then my finishing score was not very good. So I took the information that I, 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 I got there that I was ahead of the beat and I just tried to physically and mentally relax and now my timing is a lot more locked in. It's a lot more solid and uh, I'm not rushing as much, which is really cool. So the other coach functions that you have are quiet count, which is really cool. Quiet count plays several bars of a, of a, of a click and then a silent bar and then basically just scores how accurate you are in the silence and landing back on the beat and you've got a warm-up mode which is really great for timing warm-up so if you want to work on something like hand technique or you know if you're going to play a double-handed hi-hat groove and you want to work on your speed and control there you can choose different lengths of warm-up so how many minutes long the warm-up is and then the click will gradually raise and lower to give you a sense of how your control is at different tempos. So there are three built-in coach functions that are really great for improving your playing that not only just score you, but also give you a visual representation of what things are looking like, you know, against the grid generated by the metronome. So I'm gonna show you one other way that's really cool, uh, another really great way to work on practicing and improving your time. So again, I'm just gonna find sort of a random kit here. And one of the things that we didn't talk about in the kit edit menu was the multi effects, which is a really, really cool thing. So each kit that you design in the TD27 can have three multi effects applied to it. So there are uh, over 30 effects in the TD27 and there are filters, there are delays, there are um, uh, pitch shifters, there's chorus, there's flanger, there's all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, to totally, you know, just just totally warp your sound if you want or for a more subtle effect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn multi effects one on and I'm going to use a delay. It's I'm going to use a tempo sync delay so I can change, you know, how long the delay is, what type of delay, whether it's based on, you know, eighth note or sixteenth note, etc. Um, so I'm going to change this to, let's try a dotted eighth note delay on one side and a quarter note delay on the other. And the cool thing is the delay is, is dependent on the click track or the metronome setting that you have. So whatever tempo that your TD27 is set to, the delays will coincide with that. And you can go into your uh, kit edit menu, there's a function here called other, and I can choose a kit tempo so that whatever tempo I have my metronome set at, if I go to... Um, this kit that I'm configuring right now, let's say I want my kit tempo to be, let's uh, turn kit tempo on and let's change it to 72, okay? So now no matter what tempo the metronome is set at, if I go to this kit, uh, this 64, which I can rename later, I might call this 72 BPM later, or something like that, it'll always default to 72 for this kit. So if you want to set up a, a, an effect that works for a particular song, you can set the metronome so that it only goes to your headphones, have an effect on your snare drum or kick drum or whatever you want that is dependent on the tempo that is locked in for this particular kit, which is really cool. So anyway, so let me go back to that multi effect. So I've turned my delay on. I'm going to assign my snare to it. So you've got three effects available for each kit. So I'm gonna deactivate all the other instruments. I'm gonna send them to a different effect, which I'm not going to enable. So I just want for now, just the snare drum going through the effect. Now I'm going to choose send. So the amount of send is how much of the snare signal is going through that effect. So I'm going to turn it up a little bit here. So if I, I'm just going to turn it up to 0 dB. Okay. So now every time I hit the snare, you're going to hear that delay. And then I also have got a control here where I can have this signal be dry. Uh, 
a wet dry mix so it's a combination of the original signal and the effect signal or I can send it just the effect signal so without the, the original signal so you've got all of control how those effects work and one of the cool things is that kind of like I was saying with the metronome or the backing track music the effects can be routed separately through different outputs so if you want to send dry drums out of your master out, out uh, master output and then the effects out of a separate output to give you a front of house engineer, mix engineer, more control later on, you can do that, which is really cool. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the, the snare as wet dry so that you can hear both. Okay. And the cool thing is now because I've got this delay set to the snare, which is a, a time sensitive effect, this is a really great way of working on your own sense of tempo. Because if I just play random speed Okay. So that does not sound very good because the delay and what I'm playing are not related. They don't have any sort of musical correlation, okay? So what I can do is I'm going to turn my mic off for a second for this next example. I'm going to play the snare a couple times, find the tempo through the delay, and now it's more challenging than playing to a metronome because I've got sort of like this moving target that I have to correlate with. Etc. So now, you know, that effect, that delay, that ping pong and delay effect is correlated or is close to correlated with what I'm playing because I'm using it as a tempo reference. So that's kind of like a fun, creative way that you can, uh, can work on, on controlling your time and, and hearing and responding to time. Because uh, when we play with other musicians, usually they aren't playing this for us, which is you know what we get when we play along with the metronome. Uh, there's a great quote from Benny Greb, who's a fantastic drummer, who says, you know, if playing along to a quarter note metronome is like the metronome's going, ah, good job. He's patting you on the back, saying, ah, oh, that was great, good one, yeah, I landed that one too, right? So when you're playing with other musicians or playing along with music, you usually don't have like this static single click track to play along to. You have different rhythms coming at you from different places, so it's up to you to interpret those rhythms, understand how they fall against sort of a you know a, a master clock or master tempo and then it's up to you to sort of play things that correlate with that and then and then of course take charge of that tempo so playing along with delays is a really cool way of doing that so the, all of those effects are, are again like I said completely mappable if you want you know um, a flange on your kick drum and then delay on your snare and then you want to filter your toms you can do all that which is really cool so those are some of the ways that the TD27 can help you in terms of practicing you can play along to music that you're learning. If you're loading it in from an SD card, you can speed it up or slow it down to make a different section or a certain section easier to play or to challenge yourself. You can loop a certain section of it if you want to sort of like work on nailing a particular fill or a particular groove. Um, you can play along to anything. So you can plug in uh, a device using a cable to the aux input on the back. If you've got a Bluetooth capable phone or tablet or, or computer, you can send audio to the TD27 through Bluetooth. And, uh, and of course, you can plug your TD27 in via USB. So that's what I'm going to talk about right now. I want to get into that a little bit. Uh, the cool thing about the entire current uh, lineup or range of V-Drums kits is that they are all audio and MIDI compatible with a computer via USB. OK, so let's talk about audio and MIDI for a second. So audio is exactly what it sounds like. It's sound. It's what you hear, OK? So when I, when I plug my headphones into my V-Drums module, I'm receiving audio and I'm hearing the audio. But that audio is generated by MIDI information, OK? So MIDI is sort of like a universal electronic language for information about music performance and to allow different electronic or digital instruments to communicate with each other, okay? So basically, when you play your V drums, the impulses sensed by the triggers, the piezo triggers or the electrostatic sensors in this kit are sent to the module. The module converts those impulses to MIDI information and then converts that MIDI information into audio. So one of the really cool things that you can do with the TD27, TD17, TD50 is send both audio and MIDI to your computer or receive it from your computer just through a USB cable. So I know there have been, there have been some uh, questions and I'm seeing one right here. Jeff Lubick says, play something everyone knows. Um, uh, I'm going to avoid trampling over anybody's intellectual property rights here. Um, okay, so I see a question here that's related to what we're talking about right now. So I'm going to answer this. Okay, uh, 
Uh, Mark asks, if I'm recording into a DAW, or DAWS, Digital Audio Workstation, can I get separate tracks, i.e. kick track, snare track, tom track, hi-hat track? Yes. With the TD-27, you can do that. With the TD-50, you can do that. With the TD-17, you can send stereo audio, so like a single mix or single picture of the entire kit sound. But with the TD-27 and the TD-50, you can multi-track right from the module into your computer with USB. You don't need any additional gear. So that's an amazing thing. Okay, so what I want to do right now is I'm just going to do a little screen, screen share. I'm going to show you the, uh, the, the, the DAW or the, the DAW, the audio sequencing recording program that I'm using. So uh, I'm going to open this up and I'm just going to open up my streaming service here and turn on screen share mode. Okay, cool. So now you guys should be able to see uh, this DAW. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a program called Ableton Live. And, uh, and then you can probably see my face in the lower corner so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, so in this program, I'm gonna open up my preferences here. Actually, you know, before that, what I'll talk about really quickly is that in order to get any of your VDrums modules you know, playing nice and communicating with your computer, you have to uh, download and install the driver. But the cool thing is that's really easy. The driver is free and installation instructions are included. So whatever kit module that you're using, you just surf to roland.ca, search for your product. So if you're playing a TD27 or TD50, you just search that, find your product, and there will be a downloads page where you can see any available downloads for that product. So the driver will be there and there are different drivers to work with different operating systems. So if you're a, a Mac guy or a PC guy or a Mac girl or PC girl, whatever, you can download the, the corresponding driver for your operating system um, and it will come with installation instructions. So the driver is basically just a program that runs in the background of your computer, uh, sort of runs passively and just allows information to pass back and forth between your computer and your module and allows your module to act as an audio interface. Because what I'm going to demonstrate now is the idea of using your module for all audio input and output to and from your computer. Cool, okay, so, uh, yeah, yay, I'm a Mac guy, I see. Okay, cool, so I've downloaded the driver, I've installed it, like I said, it's very quick and easy, the driver is of course free, and what you wanna do in your DAW, and you can see I've opened up my preference panel here, is um, uh, I've selected my TD27, uh, 28 in 4 out as my audio input and output device and what I'm going to do is I have to configure my inputs and my, my outputs. So I'm going to send, I'm able to send two stereo outputs or four mono outputs from the, from the computer to the TD27. So I basically have four channels of audio that I can send to the TD27 that I can route differently. So I'm going to activate those as stereo outputs. So I've got two stereo channels going from the computer into the TD27. And then my input configuration, you can see I've got a whole bunch of inputs right here. So the way this works is inputs one and two are your master output from your TD27. Three and four are your direct outputs, three and four. So you might want to keep those selected as mono inputs. And then inputs five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, et cetera, are all individual um, uh, lines for your drum and cymbal pads. So the TD27 KV that I have in front of me, um, I'm just gonna talk really quickly about the pad set for a second, is I've got kick drum, snare drum, three toms, ride cymbal, hi-hats, two crashes. I can also plug in three additional auxiliary pads, so I might grab something like a, you know, like a PD-8, which I just plug into the aux input on the back of the module with a cable like this, and I can expand my kit very easily. And all of those inputs, so the, you know, the components that come with the kit, any components that you might add after, all get their own audio track in Ableton. So I'm gonna go back to screen, sh screen share mode here so you can see Ableton. So I've enabled all of, oops, sorry, uh, all of those inputs to work with the computer. So now uh, I'm gonna go to my MIDI section. I'm just gonna ensure that I've got the TD27 um, enabled as a MIDI tracking device for now. So I can send MIDI into my computer and from my computer to the TD27 because I've got track mode enabled. So now if I open up the other view here, I can select my TD27 as my MIDI in device so I can record MIDI information. Like I was saying, that's basically just the, um, the, the raw data of uh, my performance. So it's not actually 
audio. Hope you could have a recording clinic sometime soon. Okay, yes, Peter, three additional pads. And Arden Drums, I see you're asking about a recording clinic. We did one of those at our Inspiration Center in Toronto last year, and that was actually the focus of the clinic that I was gonna do today in Burlington if it wasn't for this lockdown. So hopefully, uh, you know, we're in drum month right now and everything that we're gonna be presenting to you is of course gonna be online uh, through streaming, but hopefully when stores are open again, we could do a streaming clinic, hopefully at a store near you. So drop a line to your local Long & McQuaid, let them know what you're looking for because they listen, you know, they wanna know what their customers are interested in. So if you're interested in recording, I would love to come do a recording clinic at your store and really, really get into detail with this. Um, but I'm going to go back into, uh, into, into the thick of it. So we'll call this, you know, this first track is MIDI, TD27 is enabled. Um, right now I've got it set to all channels. So it'll record all the information about my entire performance, all the drums, all the cymbals onto one MIDI track. If I want to record different MIDI tracks for different instruments, I can do that as well. But there's no glaring reason for us to need to do that right now. And then what I can do is I can set my audio track. So for example, we'll call this track... Uh, Track number two, we'll call it kick, and the kick was input five and six. We'll call this track snare. This track uh, was seven and eight, etc. So, you know, I just go down the list. I might not make a track for every single one, um, but, you know, just to give you the ID here. So, Tom one. So, I'm just going to duplicate this. And we'll make some more Tom channels. Uh, you'll just have to forgive my labeling for now. Okay, so we've got some tom channels. So after 13 and 14, we've got the hi-hat. Oops, I need my input, not my output. Okay, so let's get, you know what, let's, I'll just leave it there for now, okay? So I've got my kick, my snare, my toms, and my hi-hats. I could route the ride cymbal and the crash cymbals all individually as well. Or if I wanted, I could do something like routing the, the cymbals to my master output and record them as a single stereo channel. Let's see, I've got a question coming in here. We can't see your mouse cursor. Okay, it's hard to follow without the pointer. Okay, I will see if there's something that I can do about that in OBS screen share. You know what, I think because of the mode that I have, um, the mouse is not gonna show up. So I will try to explain what I'm doing. So I'm just creating auto audio tracks on the right side of the kit. So I'm gonna open up, so I created seven audio. Uh, that was my hi-hat track. So this is this sort of purple colored track. So I just select that, select it exterior in because I'm using my TD27 as an exterior sound card. And I'm selecting 1516, which is my hi-hat input channel. On the very far right side of the screen, you can see these, these red dots, uh, or sorry, black dots against red squares. So that just means I've enabled the recording. And I'm gonna do one more thing here. Uh, I've got a click track in Ableton, but I don't really want you guys to hear that because it's sort of annoying. So I'm going to change my, my master output to 3-4 so that my secondary output from the computer, I have routed to just my headphones. If I play this metronome, I should be able to hear that, but you should not. So I can hear the metronome. You can't. Excellent. Okay. So now I'll just enable global recording and I'll record something with the kick, snare, toms, and hi-hat. Okay, cool. So I know you're just sort of seeing random limbs flailing around in the background, but if I open up these tracks, you can see now, so I've got individual audio files from each of those sources. And again, like I said, at the moment, I'm just recording the input from my kick drum, my snare drum, the three toms and the hi-hats, but you have individual inputs for each and every pad, or you can route those inputs through the master and direct outputs however you want. So if you don't necessarily want to record symbols individually one at a time, you could record your symbols as a group out of the master output and then drums individually, or you could even put the toms together as one group if you wanted to. So it, it all comes down to basically the processing speed that your computer has, you know, how recording capable it is, and how detailed you want your mix down process to be later. So the other cool thing that I have here is I can, you know, uh, I'm gonna, turn my master output back to my main output so that you can hear this. So any audio that I'm using within this program 
because I'm using the TD27. I figured someone's <laughs> commenting on the uh, the painting. Amazing. Um, Okay, so the, uh, you know, you can see that these individual sounds, you know, now I've just got, you know, for example, like, let me just select just this kick drum. If I just want to hear just kick, I can just select just the kick drum. So now, you know, if I want to, for example, apply things like, you know, if I want to apply EQ to the, the kick drum, compress the kick drum, etc., I can do all that, which is really cool. And because I'm using the TD27 as my audio interface, uh, anything that I'm working on in the program, I'm hearing through the output of my TD27. So again, I don't necessarily need to have another device like an audio interface to do all this stuff. I can just plug my, um, my Ableton. Okay, I'm just seeing something here. Um, so I can just uh, um, use the TD27 for all incoming and, out and, and outgoing audio and I don't have to have any separate gear. It's just again, like I said, once you've got the module in your computer connected with the USB cable, you don't need anything else. So I see a question about, uh, is there important Ableton info in the lower left hand? There is not. So the part of the, of the, the program that my face is blocking is just uh, sort of like Ableton uh, shortcut uh, kind of tips and tricks that you don't need to see and I don't need to see. So I've made sure to put the camera so it's not blocking anything important. So that's recording audio. And again, like I said, you know, if I, let's say, let's say I don't necessarily want to like go crazy mixing this down. If I just want to quickly, quickly create, um, uh, just a snapshot of an idea, I'm going to create an, uh, you know, a different name for this track. I'm just going to call this track whole kit and we'll change it to inputs, uh, one and two, and I'll just record a little bit. Now you can hear the metronome. Okay, cool. So now that, um, sorry, I had my, uh, my headphones on there, but now I've captured an audio track of the entire kit. So it's not separated, it's just a stereo track of the entire kit. So you have a lot of flexibility. Mark Bowder says it, or Bowder, I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name, says love it, saves me from using 12 different mics. Exactly. So you get, you get the, the control later on for your mix of individual stems if you want them, but it's literally just a single USB cable into your computer, okay? So that's a really cool thing that you can do. And again, like I was mentioning earlier, any incoming audio uh, that's going into the TD27 from your computer, from the aux input, from an SD card, those can be routed to the master output or the direct outputs if you want. So if you are hearing something or playing along to some music and you want to record that into your DAW, you can do that as well if you want to. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about recording MIDI now, which is really cool. So I'm going to delete this audio track that says whole kit. And now I've selected this track called MIDI. We'll call this TD27 MIDI. I'm going to enable, record, enable this. I'm going to change my metronome just to um, outputs three and four so you guys don't have to hear the metronome. And let's uh, record. Okay, cool. So now what you're seeing looks very different than what we were seeing before. Okay, so I'm just going to loop a little section of this. Okay, so if I, oops, if I um, if I open up this file down below, you can see it's not a traditional waveform. It's no longer audio. Okay, if I just hit play now and listen back to this file, I hear absolutely nothing because I don't have any sounds. Um, assigned to it, and that's one of the really cool things with MIDI is that because it's raw information. You've got a lot of freedom to how you can use that information later on. So just see a question here about does the TD17 report sending multi-track through MIDI, although it's limited to stereo and using audio. So JF, you're asking about sending MIDI from the TD20, TD17. Sorry. So you can record MIDI with the TD17, and all you would need to do is just um, just uh, in the module. I'm going to show you this really quickly. Actually, let me, let me get out of uh, screen share mode here. Let's go back to camera mode. I'm going to show you the module. So in your TD17, if you want to record multi-track MIDI, what you do is you go into your kit edit menu. Uh, I look a little bit different on yours and you're go going to go to the other uh, functions in inside your kit edit menu. Um, 
you'll access this on the, uh, the right side of your TD17 module. And then you're going to go to what's called Kit MIDI. And in that uh, Kit MIDI submenu, you can designate the MIDI channel excuse me, you can designate the MIDI channel that each instrument is outputting. So you could designate kick drum as MIDI channel one, uh, snare drum as MIDI channel two, hi-hats as MIDI channel three, so on and so forth. And then I'm gonna go back to screen share. And then in your program, uh, you're gonna see on the right side of the kit beside the brown square that says TD27 MIDI. Right now I have uh, Ableton recording all channels. So every single MIDI note that I'm playing is being sent to the computer. If you've got individual MIDI channels set up in your TD17 for different pads, you can set this input to be those MIDI channels from your TD17. So you can have a single channel for kick and snare. So you can multi-track record MIDI and get separate MIDI recordings of your individual pads and symbols from the from the TD7. You can do the same thing. You've got to put all your symbols on one MIDI channel so they record together. You can do that. So there are a few different cool things that you can do with MIDI. So you know what a lot of people are doing these days is they're using um, like a drum VST. I'm just going to load in sort of like this this simple one so it doesn't use up tons of processing powers because we're using OBS as well. So this is a drum VST. So now the drum VST, this Easy Drummer program, is going to convert this MIDI performance that I recorded into audio. Okay, so we'll hear what that sounds like. We're just gonna send the output to the headphones. Okay, so now I'm using those sounds from Easy Drummer generated by my performance that I recorded with MIDI. So it's not sounding super hot right now um, because my settings are, I'm not sure Actually, if you can see, can you see? Okay, so unfortunately you can't see the Easy Drummer window, um, but I can go in. Uh, I promise you there is an Easy Drummer window here. I'm just gonna go in and quickly change a couple settings. So most drum VSTs like Superior Drummer, Easy Drummer, Steven Slate Drums, BFD, et cetera, they will have um, an eDrums uh, mapping menu where you can just choose, like I can tell this program that I'm using a rolling kit and I can change my hi-hat uh, performance curve. So now if we listen back to that, Okay, cool. So now I've converted my MIDI performance from the TD27 into audio using this drum VST. So again, I'm just using a, a program right now called Easy Drummer, but any drum VST will do this. Um, if I wanna get really crazy with things, I can drag, for example, I'm gonna go to the right side of my kit. I'm gonna drag a drum rack onto here and I can you know, find just random sounds. So I'm gonna open up my list of drum sounds, for example. I'm gonna grab um, a kick drum hit. So right now I don't have any sounds assigned, so I'm gonna find a kick drum sound that I like. Let's find something kind of cool here. Okay, so I'm gonna change my master output so you guys can hear this stuff. So let me find a cool sounding kick drum. Okay, Ninja Kick, that's pretty bombastic sounding, okay? So I know just from previous experience that my kick drum is sending MIDI on note C1. So all I have to do is just drag this Ninja Kick on a C1 and now, every time a kick drum happens in the performance, it's playing this Ninja Kit sample. Okay, so let me just find a snare sample. So again, I'm not gonna go through and recreate the entire performance, but let me just use that filter Ninja. We're gonna find Ninja sounds here. Okay, Ninja Snare 3 is pretty cool, so I know my snare is on D1. Okay, so again, you know, um, I'm just picking random sounds here, but the idea is that any MIDI performance can be routed through any sampling software or drum VST. Um, you know, this isn't just uh, something that works in Ableton. If you're a Logic user or Pro Tools or Fruity Loops or, or Reaper or whatever, whatever DAW or audio software you're using, whatever sampler software you're using, you can accomplish these things, okay? So I'm not gonna get super deep into this because this isn't really an Ableton clinic or a sampling clinic or a VST clinic, um, but I just want you to know that, you know, there are a ton of programs that allow you to do really similar things. So one last thing that I'm gonna show you right now is if we take a closer look at this performance, we can see that, you know, because I'm a human being, I'm not really, you know, my time isn't perfect. I'm, you know, again, I'm, I'm a little ahead of the beat sometimes, I'm a little behind the beat sometimes, um, and I'm not happy about that. Let's say I wanna send this performance to someone to use on their song. I don't think this is good enough for that. So I'm gonna select all these notes, 
okay? And again, I'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty nitty of this because this is uh, more of a VDRUMS tutorial than an Ableton thing, but I'm going to use a, a function called quantize, which basically just, you know, uh, corrects the timing of the note. So I use like a, a 16th note kind of subdivision most times, so I'm going to select a 16th note uh, quantize grid, and I'm going to quantize to, let's say, let's not quite perfect, let's go to a quantize setting of 85, so it corrects things to 85% of where they really should be. So they are closer to being on the grid, but they're still a human element. So my dynamics are still reflected in the performance, and my, um, my feel is still sort of in there, although it's been smoothed out a little bit. So I'm going to do one other cool thing here. So instead of using sounds from Ableton or sounds from a drum VST, I'm going to open up uh, an Ableton instrument called External Instrument. So you can see this on the left side of the screen. I've got an instrument highlight called External Instrument. So if I drag that onto the track, now at the bottom you should be able to see I've got External Instrument, this little sh you know, device has shown up beside my face. Okay. So what I can do with this is I can send the MIDI that I've recorded back to the TD27. The TD27, most VDRUMS modules receive audio on channel 10 or sorry, receive MIDI on channel 10. By default, you can change that if you want, but I'm going to, uh, you know, it's already on default of channel 10, so I'm going to leave it there. Now, when I play this MIDI track, it's going to send the MIDI back to the module and play the sounds from the module. So it's going to be my performance, but improved, but using the internal sounds. So if you configure a kit, you know, that's got sounds that you love in your TD27 and you record a performance with it and isn't, it isn't quite as tight or consistent um, uh, as, as you'd like it to be, you can correct it and then send it back and get that same audio. And then what you can do here is, you know, for example, set up, I'm just, again, I'm going to do just as a quick demonstration, I'm going to use just the stereo input of the TD27 and I can now record the audio being generated by this corrected MIDI performance. So we get a couple bars of pre-roll, and you're going to hear the drum. Okay, cool. So now I've recorded the audio of that corrected performance. So uh, the reason you might want to do this rather than recording audio and then quantizing it is if you're if you're moving audio around, if you're quantizing audio, especially if you have to drag something later, if, uh, if you need to create more space before or after a note, it can create audio artifacts that are just sort of like unwanted, warbly little pitch distortions that you don't want in your recording. MIDI is, editing MIDI is non-destructive and any adjustments that you make to the timing of a note will not affect the audio generated by a VST or generated by your TD27. So if you are recording and you, and you don't think you're going to be, you know, hopefully you think you're going to be happy with your recorded take, um, but if you're not confident that the performance is going to be exactly what you want, recording MIDI, MIDI sorry, recording MIDI, correcting it or editing it, and then re-recording the audio is a non-destructive way of uh, improving a performance and then getting great sounding audio. So those, is, those are some really cool things that you can do. So I'm going to stay in screen share mode for a little bit. I'm going to open up another set here. I want to talk about making samples. So I had a few, I'm just going to delete. I don't want to keep any of that performance. That's okay. So uh, I've already seen a few questions come in about, um, I see, uh, saw some questions here. Okay, cool. Uh, nothing doesn't look like anything critical is coming. Sorry, I'm just trying to stay on top of questions uh, while I roll through all this MIDI stuff. I would love to love to get to every question one at a time, but I promise I'm going to go through all these questions later. And uh, anything that I didn't get to in this presentation, I'm going to answer in text later. And feel free to, to PM me if you'd like further information. Um, very happy to help you with whatever you need. Okay, so I've seen a couple questions about where to get that snare sample or how to download that snare sample. So uh, that snare sample, as I mentioned, that, um, that John Bonham snare sample, that's just a, oops, sorry about that. Let me stop this. Okay, cool. So that snare sample isn't something that I downloaded, it's something that I created. So I have a copy of, so again, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to play the whole song because we don't want to infringe on any intellectual property uh, rights here, but I basically have a copy, an audio file of the original song, okay, so that's uh, Dear Maker 
by Led Zeppelin. So I'm just going to find that in my computer. You're not going to be able to see this window for a second because I'm only sharing my Ableton view. But let me just quickly drag that in here. Um, random music downloads. Let me find Dear Maker. Okay, so I'm going to drag that into Ableton. Okay, so now you should see in the top frame of Ableton, you should see I've created a track with Dear Maker on it. So again, I can't play the whole thing because we're not going to in, uh, infringe on any intellectual property rights, but let me play you that fill. So this is what the fill sounds like at the beginning of the song. Oh man, that feel is incredible. Just how he lays back on that, that tom roll at the end is just, just ridiculous. Okay, anyway, I'm not gonna get into that. So if I double click on this, now you can see at the bottom of Ableton, I've been, uh, opened up my sample editing screen, okay? So I'm gonna choose something called Warp because Ableton gives me a really handy function. I can just find a transient. So if you look, these first four snare hits at the bottom of the screen, I'll have a tiny little tick mark over them so I can just select that tick mark. So you might remember I was talking about transients earlier on. So the transient is the initial impact or the very first initial instance of a sound that you're hearing, okay? So these little tick marks over the notes at the bottom of the screen are the transients. So I can reliably, reliably click on one of these in Ableton and then trim right at that spot and know I'm trimming right at the beginning of that hit. Let's say for some reason, you know, if you're not using Ableton or the program that you're using does not enable you to do that, you can still zoom in to the actual audio file itself and find that transient yourself. Just what you have to be careful of is sometimes the transient isn't necessarily immediately apparent in the waveform. So um, it might take a little bit of trial and error, but you want to avoid cutting off the transient because you want that attack. You don't want the, the attack to be tamed. Um, or maybe you do, in which case you can cut after the transient and then fade the sound in. But I digress. So at the bottom of the screen, I'm going to select that tick mark or the fourth snare drum because if you look at this file at the bottom of the screen, you can see visually that the fourth snare hit is the one that has the most amount of space after it, okay? And that's what you're looking for for like a drum sample. If you want to create a sample of a single hit, you want as much space after it so it will decay naturally as possible. You don't have to cut it off to avoid hearing a sound that comes after. So I'm going to select that transient on that fourth snare hit. I'm going to cut the top file at that mark. I'm just going to drag that back so it's more straightforward to see how things line up. And then I'm going to go into that same editing suite at the bottom and I'm going to select the transient of the next note. I'm going to cut my main file off there and I'm going to delete everything that happens after. So now at the top of the screen you can see, I'm just going to see if there is, that bottom sample you made sounds exactly like the song. Okay so Peter, that's a good point because I stole the one from the song. Sorry. I borrowed the one from the song. So this is the actual snare drum hit. So you're seeing how I'm taking the audio from the song and, uh, and re-exporting that audio so I can use it in my TD27. Okay, so let's have a listen to this snare file. Okay, cool. So I hear that, you know, fat attack and nice decay of that drum and I'm hearing some, you know, some room ambience which was part of the magic of the John Bonham drum sound. But you notice that when that wave file ends, you can see that little blue file sort of in the top middle of the screen. When that gets cut off, when that ends, the audio also ends. So it's got this sort of like artificial uh, cut off that we don't really like. We don't really want that. It's not really a desirable sound. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the volume automating in Ableton to create a velocity curve. And again, uh, you know, uh, different programs are going to handle this sort of velocity curve or velocity automation differently. So that's what you're going to look for. You're going to look for volume automation or a level automation. And I'm going to create uh, a level basically that drops over the course of the sample down to down to silence. So now the sound will gradually get quieter until you hear silence. So now, you know, it's still a bit of a short sample, but now it decays more naturally and it doesn't sound artificially cut off. Okay, if I want to, um, I can maybe go into my audio effects. So on the left side of the screen, I can select something like reverb, for example. Let's say I want to lengthen that note a little bit. I can drag some reverb onto that track. I'm just going to quickly punch in some reverb settings. I'm just going to sort of just quickly, I'm not going to again talk in detail about how to use reverb because that's a whole other uh, topic altogether. Um, one important thing that I'll mention is that the wet dry uh, knob in the reverb is a balance of how much the original or unaffected signal uh, and how much of the signal is affected by the reverb. So if it's all wet, you're going to hear nothing but reverb. So we don't want it 100% wet. We want to have a mix of wet and dry and that's salt to taste. I mean, you can just pick a setting that sounds good to you or feels good to you. Um, so my reverb's a little bit short there. I might lengthen that. Let's 
lengthen that and then just add a little bit more. Okay, cool. So now there's a little bit more reverb. Um, okay, so what I can do is, uh, oops, created a MIDI track there. So I'm going to create another audio track. We'll call this reverb and I'm going to drag my reverb plugin down to that track. I'm going to write the audio from the first track there. So I'm writing the audio from the snare sample into this reverb track and I'm going to record what that sounds like. Okay, so let's hear. So we'll hear a bit of click, get a bit of pre-roll, then we'll record. Cool, okay. So now all I have to do is just, I'm gonna put another volume automation there. Okay, cool. So now I've got a nice blend of these two signals. So I might, uh, might just turn this clip down a little bit, okay. So now I've got my original snare sample. Okay, yeah, this, uh, there we go. Long Quaid Music Whisper says, because you made it using the real song. Thank you, Matt. Um, okay, so now I've got, you know, my original source signal, signal up at the top. I've got a reverb signal at the bottom, and I can just export those. So I've got, you know, the length of those two sounds, and then I can just open up my export audio video. And then the quick way to, to, to get a good level or a good volume for your sample is to use this function called normalize. Okay, so if I activate normalize when I export or bounce or print this file and make a new audio file out of these samples, if I hit normalize or activate normalize, it will export a sample uh, that's at the highest volume that the, the program or Ableton or your DAW is generating so that you get the loudest possible signal. So that's a very, very important thing when you're creating samples. You wanna export things at the highest possible volume you can before they clip so that it's very easy to blend those with your V-Drum sounds later on. If you export a sound and it's really quiet, it's gonna be hard to get it loud enough in your module later. So you wanna export it as loud as possible. So the other, you know, there's a manual way of doing this as well. So if I just play this snare sample a few times, I can look that I'm, you know, if I look in my master output, you know, I'm, I'm sort of coming out at minus 10 dB so I could, you know, I could use different effects or different plugins. I could, you know, change the volume of my master, ma master output, or I could, you know, use a utility plugin to add some more gain or whatever, you know. So now that's, you know, that's too loud now. It's clipping, so that's too loud. Anyway, so there are manual ways to do this, but it's very important, the point is, it's very important that when you are creating a sample to use in your V-Drums, you export it as loud as possible. So the easy way to do that is if your DAW or audio software has, um, uh, like I was saying, uh, a normalize function. You can normalize and it will normalize your, your file at the highest possible headroom without distorting. Um, or you can just do it manually if you feel comfortable doing that, which is great. So that's really cool. Um, I'm gonna show you some other cool things that you can do. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how I made a couple loops here, okay? So I've got some sound, uh, um, I've got some, uh, some stems from a song that I, I I, I work with a song from an artist that I work with. Man, I can't speak. So I'm going to drag this. So this is called MAY Instruments, okay? So this is just an audio track of synth sounds, and I think there's some guitar in there. Okay, so that's just some random synth stuff. I'm just going to quickly change the tempo of this file to 101, which I know is the correct tempo for this song, because, hey, I play it sometimes. And I'm going to do a similar process. I'm going to just pick a selection of this music. Let's see what this section sounds like. Okay, cool. So that's a nice little section. And let's see what uh, this section sounds like. Okay, that's nice too. Okay, so I've got two sections of music. This one's a little bit more hype. Let's call this chorus. This one's a little bit more chill. Let's call this verse. So I've got these, these files that are longer phrases of music, okay? So one of the really cool things that you can do with your TD-17, your TD-50, your TD-27 is you, you can play loops instead of just single hits. And you can trigger those from pads, which is really fun. So I'm going to get away from the computer in a second, okay? Um, let's do that right now, actually, because we've been in the computer for a while. Let's get out of the computer for a second. Okay, hello. You remember what I look like? I don't. So what I've done is... Uh, Earlier today, I created some loops using uh, some of those instrumental sections and put them on that same SD card. So again, it's very simple to use. You know, you just load those WAV files. Anything that you load into the TD27 needs to be a 44.1 kilohertz 16-bit WAV file. So that's 
uncompressed. We used to call it CD quality. If people even call it that anymore, I'm not sure because we don't really use CDs very much anymore, unfortunately. But uh, um, you know, 16-bit, 44.1 kilohertz wave files. That's uh, lossless, high-quality audio. So that's the file format that it has to be in. And just chuck those files onto your SD card, and you can load them in. So I'm going to switch to module view again. So we're going to go back into that user sample menu. I'm going to go into import. I'm going to get out of this menu because I'm in those recording in that section of recordings where I have my awful melodica playing. So let's go into the root menu where I imported these these uh, these loops. Okay. So I'm going to import uh, Mad About You chorus. It's called. I'm going to put that on sample slot 5, which is open. The loops are a little bit longer, so they take a little bit longer to import. Obviously, the longer the audio file is, the longer it's going to take to sort of uh, import it. But once you've imported it, it's saved in your module, and you can play it, edit it, uh, route it how you please without having to have your SD card connected. So I'm going to go back to import. I'm going to import my... Oops, hitting wrong buttons here. I'm going to import the other phrase there. So I imported the chorus. I'm going to import the verse now. So I'm just going to quickly import those. We'll let that happen. And then you might remember earlier, I adjusted the, the uh, sample play type for the bottom snare. I changed it from a mono or you know single instance to a poly sample where it will play over top of itself. There is a third sample play type that you want to use for loops, which is very conveniently called uh, loop alt mode. So I'm just going to go into the module, and I'm going to select both of those samples, those loops that I um, imported, and I'm going to change my play type to loop alt mode. So loop means the sample will play back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and continually restart. And alt means uh, I can trigger that with alternating hits. So whatever uh, pad I assign that loop to, I can start the loop with a hit and then stop the loop with a hit of the same pad. So that's a really cool thing. So let me go back in my module. I'm just going to pick, let me find something kind of electronica sounding because that's sort of the vibe of this song. So let's find a let's ambient beat. Cool, so that's sort of like acoustic-y, electronic-y. Maybe I'll, I want something a little bit more in your face, I think. I'm not sure. Let's find a... All right, that's a little bit more electronic in there. Crunch beat. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my kit edit menu. Um, I'm going to uh, select the instrument. Uh, I'm going to select, let's put the, the verse loop on crash one. So I'm going to select the instrument. I'm going to go through my bank of sounds. I'm going to find my user samples. And I'm going to put Mad About You verse on the, uh, oops. Oh, that's what we're doing here. OK, cool. Um, Put it on the kick drum because I'm a goofball. Okay, so check this out. I've made a mistake. Mistakes are very easy to correct. If I go into Kit Edit and I hit Other and I hit Copy, I can copy either a single pad or an entire kit. And here's a cool thing. I can copy either the user kits that I've created or I can copy the original preset. So I messed up 45 crunch beat, so I'm going to um, copy preset 45 to user 25. And now, that change that I made is undone. Boom. So it's very easy to get back to your original sound. So what happened is I had the, the trigger kick uh, the kick trigger lock. So I put the sample on the, the kick drum instead of the crash cymbal. So let's correct that. So let's go into kit edit. Let's um, uh, turn trigger lock off. Let's select instrument. OK. So what I'm going to do here is for the crash cymbal, instead of putting the loop as my main sound, I'm going to put the um, the loop as my sub instrument. So that way I still hear a crash cymbal. So I'm getting the original source sound of the crash as well as a loop of that verse loop, you know. Okay, so I just hit the trigger once to start it, hit it again to stop it, okay? Etc. So you can hear as soon as I hit that crash, I stop that loop. So that's really handy if you're going to be importing loops that you want to use for different songs that your band's playing or, or, or whatever. Um, you can set different sections up onto different paths. There's a bit of muscle memory and a bit of mental memory to remember, okay, like my verse is over here and my chorus is over here, and that's a 
but that's a cool thing and it's a good skill to have. So what I'm really quickly going to do is for my secondary crash here, I'm going to turn sublayer on and I'm going to put the chorus uh, loop, which is the other melodic loop and harmonic loop, onto this cymbal. So that sounds like... <laughs> Okay, cool. So I've got my two loops here. So what I have to be careful of is that because these are both set to alt mode, if I play them both at slightly different times, there's a bit of chaos happening. So I'm gonna use a really cool feature called mute grouping, okay? So if I go into kit edit and I go into um, other and I select the mute group submenu, now I can choose which drums and cymbals are muting other drums and cymbals. So if you're playing like a traditional acoustic style sound, this is probably not something that you're going to need or want to do, but for using loops, this is very handy. Or if you want to create unconventional sounds, um, mute grouping is a really cool way to get some creative effects. What I'm going to do is um, if I hit uh, you know, my crash here, I've selected mute send. So I'm going to send uh, a mute group uh, control signal on mute group one and I'm going to select the mute receive so I'm sending from here and it's going to be received by this crash symbol so now I'm sending a signal from this symbol to this symbol to tell this one to stop and I'm going to do the same thing so if I go up to my mute send and choose a different group I'm going to send this on group two to re be received on group two here Now the opposite is true. So this symbol will mute this symbol, and this symbol will mute this symbol. So that sounds kind of like this. Okay, so again, a very handy thing when using loops is to use mute groups. But like I said, you can do some other really interesting things. Like if I just, if I stay on this kit for a second, I'm going to go back into my mute group mode. I'm going to show you this here. So if I go into mute group mode, I have all of my available inputs shown to me. I'm going to select my kick drum, okay? So I'm going to send uh, a control signal on group three. I want this to be separate from what's happening with the, the mute grouping of the symbols. And I'm going to receive, uh, let's do this on my ride symbol. So I'm going to receive a mute send on three on all the zones of my ride symbol, the bell, the bow, and the edge, okay? Just to give you an example of some, some interesting sounds you can get. So now, if I just play the ride symbol by itself, okay, it's sort of a short sample, but it plays, right? But if I play a combination of kick drum and ride, Now, every time I play the kick drum, it mutes the ride. So again, maybe not great for like your practical, traditional, you know, normal style of drum set playing, but it's really fun to get into stuff like this, okay? So you might get some interesting sounds or be inspired to play some different grooves. Etc. So, like I said, new grouping is obviously really critical if you're going to be using multiple loops live, but it can also be used for some really, really interesting effects as well. So I'm just going to take a quick break just to see if we have any really critical questions coming through here, because I've been talking for a while. Cool. It was worth coming on the internet. Okay, I'm glad to hear. Okay. Amazing. Okay, so... Um, I want to open it up now. I mean, I've, I've covered a lot of the things, uh, you know, that I, I, I wanted to cover today, and I've kind of shown you a lot of the features. Um, yes, yes, Neil Peart is, is, is in fact a, an, an inspiration. I mean, when I, I was a Rush fan before I was a, a drummer, and, and Rush is pretty a uh, key part of me learning to love music and sort of like falling in love with the magic of music, and I, I, 
credit that to them mostly as well as yes and tom petty but uh i wouldn't say like i don't know if i've ever really tried to like i don't really play along to rush a lot i sort of let him be him and, and do my thing but uh Anyways, um, and now I just need somebody to send me four grand. Okay, so I just want to talk about a couple things. So I've, I've just really, you know, shown you a handful of things that you can do. Um, if anyone was around for the beginning of the, the performance, I was playing sort of like a piece of music um, all from the drum set. I was triggering uh, like melodic sounds and harmonic sounds from the toms and the cymbals. So there's a lot of really cool stuff that you can get into and that's all just through sending MIDI. So again, if you are at home and you've got a TD-17 or TD-27 or TD-50, um, it's worth diving into Ableton or Logic or Fruity Loops or BFD or, or whatever DAW or VSC program that you're using. And again, if you're using one of these, you know, these current, um, you know, the current lineup of V-Drums kits, you can do all this stuff through a USB cable and, and do some amazing things. If you are on an older kit like a TD-9 or, or, or something before that or a TD-20 or TD-12 or 10 or whatever, most of them are MIDI compatible through a traditional MIDI cable. So in this case, you would need um, some sort of MIDI interface. Um, we make one called the UM-1 Mark II, and that's just a USB on one end and MIDI on the other end. So you just plug a MIDI cable from your module into the MIDI input of the UM-1 and then the USB of the UM-1 into your computer, and you can send MIDI information to your computer for recording or for triggering samples. Um, so even if you have an older generation V-Drums kit, the cool thing about the language of MIDI is that a lot of the stuff is possible um, with uh, uh, with older generations of kits. So obviously, it's convenient and, and easy with a newer kit because it's got the USB compatibility. But um, there's no reason you can't dive into some really, really creative stuff by triggering samples from a computer. Um, I think I'd like to open it up now if, just to see, um, like. Like again, I'm going to try to go through. There's a lot of comments here, which is amazing. I, you know, really thank everybody for tuning in and and uh, and and sticking around and watching and listening. And, and you know, I really appreciate the um, the Long and McQuaid team and and specifically Matt uh, at Long and McQuaid for facilitating all of this. Um, so I am going to go through all this stuff and and going to check out all your comments and and answer all of your questions as I can. And see, here we go. TD3. That's a that's a, you know an, an old kit. It's a you know it's a it's that that kit's you know uh, several generations old, but you can still use it with MIDI to trigger like fantastic sounds and 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 get a great recording of your of your performance. So before I before I go, I do want to just open it up just to see if there are any specific questions that I can answer right now. I'm seeing a question about the VAD 506. So yeah, if anyone's not familiar with the VAD 506, VAD is V Drums Acoustic Design. That's a very exciting new concept for us at Roland. Um, we showed off the kits at NAMM, so there are videos online that you can see about them. Uh, all the product information is, is available. Uh, if you go to roland.ca, you can read all about the VAD kits or just check out uh, our YouTube channel or, or Long McQuaid's YouTube channel to check out some videos about the VAD. So the VAD kit, um, the, our first, uh, first few kits, there's the VAD 503 and 506, which are uh, the TD27 module, but instead of a traditional V-Drums pad set, the kick drum, snare drum, and toms are in acoustic shells. They're still mesh heads. Uh, you know, Roland's amazing uh, double ply crosswoven mesh head technology. Our you know piezo sensors with new improved sensor housing and, and positioning. Um, newly designed thinner V symbols, so more flex. You know, a nice buttery feel. Uh, still with the CY. 18 ride and, and PD 140DS and VH10. So we're getting closer and closer to the the sort of like acoustic experience with the the V jumps kit. So the VAD kit is you know if you just love the way uh, an acoustic kit feels because of the mass and the positioning, the VAD kit will be for you because it combines the sort of like the setup of. Um, yeah, I'm seeing some questions. Excellent. Okay, um, I'm going to answer those in one second. Anyway, so check out the V80 kit. You're going to get the experience of an acoustic kit, the aesthetic of an acoustic kit. Great feel. It looks amazing. You know, midnight sparkle. It looks great, but powered with the you know the infinite possibilities of the V drums module with all the internal sounds, layering your own samples in, playing loops, using your TD27 to run audio tune from your computer, using it to trigger backing tracks live, all of that stuff. Okay. So I'm going to 
and just take a quick look at some of these questions here. Okay, what is the easiest way to transi transition into fills while keeping timing? Okay, so this is sort of like a, a, a performance and technique question, um, so I don't want to spend a ton of time on it, but I've got a good exercise for this. So um, what I'm really big on is if you want to work on, on fills and transitioning is number one, either play along to some music or play along to a metronome so you have uh, an objective sort of frame of reference to, to gauge your playing against. Because you're, you're not going to know if you're rushing or dragging um, usually if you're not playing along to something that's in perfect time. So that's step one is to use a metronome or some music that's recorded to a metronome or music that's programmed and play along to it. I'll use the metronome here just for, uh, for simplicity's sake. And what I'm really big into is um, if you're having trouble sort of like transitioning into fills, find a subdivision that works for both your fills and your groove, like for example, 16th notes, okay? Um, and create a groove based on that same subdivision. So let's say we're using 16th notes. With counting one, two, three, four, all right? So I'm gonna play a really simple fill here. One, two, three, four, okay? So what you might wanna do is pick a groove that uses the same subdivision, so something like Okay, so it's a groove and a fill, but they're using the same subdivision and the same hand or sticking pattern, which is really helpful. So I might do something like play that along with a click. So I'll just, you know, um, chuck my click track on here. Let's pick a slow tempo because working on things slowly is a great way to sort of perfect your time. So here's 64 BPM. I'm going to turn the click up just a little bit and let me just play along to that for a second. Okay, so one of the, the vital things that you want to do is listen objectively. So what I noticed, and you know, I'm definitely a human being, so none of that was perfect, but what I noticed is that when I started my fill, I noticed I was a little ahead of the beat on that first uh, beat of 16 notes on the snare drum. So kind of like I was saying earlier about um, listening to yourself, um, being able to, uh, and seeing yourself in coach mode, is that you can see sort of exactly what's happening. Because it's, it's usually easy to tell when you're off, but it's hard to tell sometimes by how much you're off or in what direction you're off. Are you ahead, are you behind, et cetera. So, you know, practice with the metronome, start with the slow tempo, try beats and fills that use the same subdivision, and then you can use the coach function. So let me get into that. Um, like I was saying earlier, I didn't demonstrate this one, but maybe I'll demonstrate it now. The quiet count function here is a really good way to work on this. So I'm gonna go into my setup mode. I have, uh, I have it set up so that there's four measures and one of them is quiet. So that means there's gonna be three measures of metronome and one bar of silence, okay? Uh, so I'm gonna open quiet count back up, go to quiet count, I'm gonna change the tempo, let's try it at 71 and see how that feels, okay? So I'm gonna hit start, and now you'll hear the metronome for a little while and then you'll hear silence and it will judge me, <laughs> it'll grade me, sorry, judge sounds harsh, it'll grade me on how accurate I am when I come back in after that fill. Rough, okay, so I rushed through that fill, okay? So again, now I say, okay, I'm like really rushing through that fill, so it will be a lot easier for me to correct that. Okay, so, um, you know, uh, tune in. Long McQuaid's got tons of, uh, of amazing, you know, clinics and workshops all year. I mean, it is drum month right now. Normally for drum month, all the stores have different cl clinicians come in and do presentations and workshops and clinics. Um, you know, you have store staff and product experts. There's all kinds of great stuff. You know, unfortunately, we're all going to have to enjoy drum month from, you know, the seat of our uh, the seat of our couch or our computer desk or behind our V drums kit or whatever. But uh, you know, always stay tuned with with your local Long Equate store because they've got clinics and workshops year round. And and you know, a lot of them, you know, the majority of them have like a really really you know an amazing. They all have amazing teaching facilities. I think I think most Long Equates now have a teaching facility and they always have really really great teachers. I've subbed in at a few of them and, and, and know a lot of guys and, and girls who teach at Lion McQuaid. They have like total pro musicians, you know, people with, with, you know, school and real life experience, you know, gigging musicians that are, you know, going to be able to help you work through, 
your, you know, whatever challenges you are working through. So, you know, lessons at Long McQuaid, clinics at Long McQuaid, check it out. Obviously, YouTube is a wealth of information, but, uh, you know, if you get into using the coach function of your TD-17 or TD-25 or TD-27 or TD-30, or sorry, TD-50, um, they all have functions to help you with that. But those are some ways that you can work on improving your time with a fill. Okay. Ah, in addition to what Miles is demonstrating, good tip from the great Benny Greb is not to hold your breath. Yes, that is something that's hard to do. Okay, cool. So I saw another question here. So Dean Brown asks, can you send separate channels to a live mixing board? So the answer is yes, okay? So the TD27 has two stereo outputs and then two mono outputs. So your headphone output is a stereo channel. Your master output is a stereo channel. And then you've got two direct outputs, which are which function as mono channels, or you can configure them to be a single stereo channel. If you want to sort of circumvent uh, those limitations, if you want, you can actually pan things. So let's say you want uh, you want even more separation. You could pan the kick to far right, pan the kick to far left, and now they're going to come out of your master on different sides. But the way the the programming is built right in, you've got a master headphone output, master. Uh, main master output and then two direct outputs. So uh, a typical live situation, what you might do is route the kick out of output one, the snare out of output two. So the you know your front of house engineer has mixed control over those. And like I was saying earlier, you can set those to be pre or post TD27 levels. So your headphone level um, doesn't necessarily have to affect the level of those going out of the direct outputs, which is important for you know you getting a good monitor mix from your headphones or, or in ears, and then the front of house engineer getting a good mix for their purposes. And then you might do something like routing the um, the toms and the cymbals through the master output as a group. So if you want even more uh, analog audio connectivity, the TD50 offers more direct channels, um, so you can route each individual pad out if you'd like to do that. But with the TD27, you can indeed um, route multiple tracks of audio. So two direct outs, a master out, and then you can you can send you know audio through the headphone output to front of house or to recording if you want. Um, if you're going to get your monitoring in a different way, you know, get it from a mixer or something like that, you can actually use the headphone output as an additional main output if you want to. And like I was saying earlier, anything that you do. Uh, Audio-wise, in the TD27 can be custom routed. So let's say you want to route your kick drum out of output one, your delay and your reverb out of output two, and then the rest of the kit out of the master output. You can do that. Or if you're in a band that runs backing tracks, you can run the backing tracks out of your master output, your drums out of output one, um, and then run a a click track to your bandmates out of output two, for example. So you've got a lot of flexibility for how incoming and outgoing sounds are routed, which is of course really important if you're gonna be recording or playing live. Okay, so let's see if there's some more. Do the digital pads add any advantage if I'm using VSTs in a DAW? Can the additional data from the digital pads only be used by the TD27 brain? So the, the outgoing MIDI is universal. So whatever you play, on your CY18DR PD140DS, all that information that's being um, passed through the TD27 into your computer, that's, like I said, that's a universal language that's uh, the MIDI information being generated can be read by any VST. So there is the additional advantage of, you know, a more detailed and more nuanced sound. There's just more, um, uh, more responsiveness and you've got, you know, a higher range essentially of, of you know, tonal variation and dynamic variation on those symbols. So the advantages of the digital pads do indeed translate into a VST or a DAW, okay? So yeah, I seeing this kit looks the same, but newer with room. So yeah, this is the newest kit, and that is one of the really nice things about the PDX100, the PD140DS pads, is there is a raised rim, so the feel of that rim and, and the way it looks and whatnot, um, uh, that's going to sort of like replicate the, the playing experience of, of an acoustic drum. Um, so I'm just going to see if there are any questions that have popped up. Okay. Yeah, make your own kits. Samples of anything can be used. Is it when you connect another Roland musician through my Roland instrument for a jam or online session? So that is a great question, Peter. So Peter is asking if he can connect um, his Roland instrument with other people playing instruments to play online. So, and Jay, I see Jay just commented, uh, that would be killer if it could be online. Jay is great if latency is solved using analog telephone with video works for latency for audio. So, so the, the issue with jamming online is, 
the the latency that comes from you know the sound being generated by or your instrument has to go into your computer it has to be sent you know either through your 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 you know your your modem wirelessly over the globe to someone else's computer that you know has to receive that information and or their device has to receive that audio and convert it so at the time it's uh, and that's that's not a limitation of using V drums. That's not a limitation of using a certain computer program. That's just the limitations of the fact that you know uh, sound takes time to get places, either in a literal sense, you know, um, for me playing the sound, somebody being able to hear it, you know, 13 kilometers away. Well, they probably can't hear it 13 kilometers away, but they're going to hear it delayed, right? And so it's the same thing when you're sending information online. So there, unfortunately, at this moment, it doesn't really seem like there's a great way to jam online. Um, so hopefully at some point in the future there will be a solution for that, but I'm really hoping we can get back to uh, being in a room um, with other musicians and playing with them. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, like it's been really, really amazing having a V drums kit at home, to being able to to practice and, and just you know keep my skills up and to, to just have fun playing and jam along to songs that I love or try to create new grooves that that you know that are unique to me. It's been great being able to do, ses do sessions at home and record tracks for people, or record audio, record MIDI, and, and send things out for people to use in their music um, and stuff like that. And it's been, you know, it's, it's great that I can, you know, run all this stuff in Ableton and trigger marimba samples and play them from the kit and stuff like that. Um, at the moment, there is no replacement for playing live with other musicians. The latency of using streaming or, you know, services like Zoom or Skype, there's just too much latency. Um, but the cool thing is if you're using one of these kits, it's very easy to file share. So you can record a groove or a, 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 you know, a song idea right onto an SD card, load it in your, into your computer and email it off. If you're connected to your computer with USB, you can record right into a DAW, export that, send it to your friends. So you know, they can maybe write a bass part or a guitar part or keyboard part or whatever over top of it. So it is very easy to create files and share them over the internet to, to create music and write music and, and, and create pieces of music like that. Unfortunately, just the limitations of, of wireless technology and wire technology in general is that uh, unfortunately uh, latency is just too much of a thing so you can jam with people it's just they're going to be a couple beats behind you so it'll uh, you know it'll sound probably kind of interesting it might be a good experiment you know um, Anyway, so uh, again, I just want to uh, thank all of you for tuning in. Really appreciate everyone who tuned in earlier, who tuned in later. If you guys stuck around for the whole thing, thank you so much. If you weren't able to see the whole thing, the presentation will be online uh, on Long McQuaid's Facebook page. I'm going to go through all your comments later tonight and, uh, and answer any questions that I didn't answer. And uh, please reach out. Um, feel free to PM me if you have any further questions. Uh, again, thanks to Matt and the rest of the team at Long McQuaid for facilitating this. Thank you, Roland, for, uh, for inviting me to be part of your family. And uh, that's me signing off. Have a great one.